this year's Red Sox, its simplicity was perfection. Great pitching from Pedro Martinez and great offense from Nomar Garcia Para. For four innings last night in Cleveland, it was perfection revisited. But then, the unexpected. The ace of the Red Sox staff forced to leave. It was a crisis in more ways than one. The powerful Cleveland lineup then flexed its considerable muscle. But there was more. A dominating 11 strikeout effort by Bartolo Colon, and then the final heroics. Today, a couple of seasoned heroes return to the big stage in the pivotal second game. A crisp, clear autumn day in Cleveland. And we're in the Gateway area of Cleveland at Jacobs Field. All roads lead to Jacobs Field. 45,000 plus will be here. It's game two of the American League Division Series, led by Cleveland, one game to none over Boston. And of course, this is also the home of Manny Ramirez, the man who had 165 RBIs this year. I'm John Miller, along with Joe Morgan. Welcome to our telecast. It's a must-win day for the Boston Red Sox. But one thing that both teams will have to try and overcome today, and we're talking about the hitters in particular, are these long October shadows here at Jacobs Field. Two years ago, Mike Messina, Oral Hershiser started a ball game here and under these conditions. 33 strikeouts in a 12-inning game. Three years ago, when the Orioles were here, Cleveland pitchers struck out 23 in 12 innings, Joe. This would be a tough day for a hitter. Well, I think this works in the favor of the Boston Red Sox because I think it's more important for Saberhagen to hold the Cleveland Indians attack down than it is for Nagy to be able to hold the Boston Red Sox down. Let's face it, this Cleveland Indian attack can get on top of you right away and put you in a lot of trouble. So I expect for him to be able to get through the first inning with these shadows and do a good job. All right, now Charles Nagy. 17 game winner this year for Cleveland two and four in postseason play but both of those wins were in division series against the Boston Red Sox against whom he is seven and one lifetime. Well I think a, a key again here is he has confidence against these guys his, he throws a lot of sinkers so we'll be able to see right away if he gets a lot of ground balls Nagy will be on his game if you start seeing the ball get in the air he could have a problem. All right now Brett Saber Higgins of the Red Sox a great pitcher he's been here many times but with shoulder problems limited perhaps to six or seven innings our spotlight reporter Rick Sutcliffe on Brett Saberhagen. Saberhagen's been in pain all year. He will be again today. Reason being, they describe it as fraying of the rotator cuff. It basically means the rotator cuff is torn. Where that creates problems is early in the game, he cannot get loose. He cannot get his shoulder back in this area to reach that velocity. Against Cleveland, you're not ready to go in the first inning. That's trouble. And then what happens, the latter part of the game, he loses his extension. He can't get out there with the fastball. The velocity starts to drop quite a bit. Boston will keep an eye on that. Normally, it hits around 80. 85, 90 pitches. They're hoping that's the sixth or seventh inning. They'll hand it to Flash Gordon, they'll hand it to Rod Beck, and I'll hand it back to you, John. All right, Rick. Rick Sutcliffe will be with us throughout the day. It's Cleveland and Boston. The Red Sox need a win. Stay tuned. Jacobs Field in Cleveland, jewel of a ballpark, part of the downtown revitalization, uh, revitalization of this city and a place that the people dearly love to come on in and enjoy a ball game from as it is a, a great venue into which to watch a ball game. There's Jimmy Williams. He may not love it quite so much as his Boston Red Sox, as is the case with many a team, have their problems in this ballpark here is the Pepsi Red Sox batting order it'll be Jose Offerman at second base John Ballington third base Jason Veritek the catcher hitting third Nomar Garcia para had quite a night here last night and including last night he's had quite a season against Cleveland which is not so surprising he's hitting nearly 400 against them in his career it'll be Troy O'Leary left field Mike Stanley first base Butch Husky the DH Trot Nixon in right field and Damon Buford a change from last night in center field hitting ninth and on the mound for the Cleveland Indians will be right hander Charles Nagy a 17 game winner this year 
and seven and one lifetime against Boston. And Nagy has all the pitches, a sinker, slider, and a good overhand curveball and a changeup. But the key to his success is him getting a lot of ground balls, and he has one of the best infields in baseball to back him up. So what he'll be trying to do is keep the ball on the ground and keep it out of the air. You see there are 202 innings, 238 hits. That means he's given a lot of opportunities for his infield to work because he's getting a lot of minutes on base. And let's take a look at the defense. This is just kind of a magical middle of the, middle of the infield. Roberto Alomar and Omar Vizquel, they do, they look like magicians out there sometimes. Not only do they make great plays, they do it with a lot of flair. Here's the first one. Watch the flair here with Roberto Alomar. And remember, Trot Nixon runs pretty well. But this is just an unbelievable play. Now watch Omar Vizquel. He calls off the center fielder and the ball's over his head and he makes it look easy. So these two guys not only do the job, they make it look so simple. And it is not. And both of them won a lot of gold gloves. Alomar seven and Vizquel has won six. The late afternoon October shadows, which worked very much in the favor of Charles Nagy three years ago when he had a ball game here against the Baltimore Orioles. He struck out 12 in six innings that day against the Orioles, but did not get a decision. Again, the Orioles eventually won. The umpiring alignment, Larry Young behind the plate, John Hirschbeck, Joe Brinkman, and Mike Riley on the bases. Daryl Cousins along the left field line, Rocky Rowe along the right field line. It is a veteran umpiring crew assigned by the American League. So here we go. It will be Jose Offerman to lead off for the Boston Red Sox. The Red Sox who have won only one game in the postseason since the night that Mookie Wilson's ground ball went through the legs of Bill Buckner in 1986 in the World Series. Game six. One win. 17 losses in postseason plays since then. And the first pitch down and away from Charles Nagy and we are underway here in Cleveland. That's what you'll see from Nagy. His fastball is more of a sinking fastball. That's a foul out of play off to the left. Jose Offerman hit 294 during the regular season. Eight homers, 69. Runs batted in. And Johnny really came back strong in the second half. He had started a struggle just before the All-Star break and it continued for a while. But he's able to bring his average back from the 270s back up to the 290s. There's a curveball you're talking about. One ball, two strikes. Nagy is a native New Englander. 32 years of age from Fairfield, Connecticut. A check swing and appeal to the third base umpire Riley. Denied. Two balls, two strikes. Nagy went to the University of Connecticut. He was a, a Husky, an economics major. Right over the middle, base hit for Offerman. So Offerman is aboard for the Red Sox. Now, of course, just as was the case in the series between Atlanta and Houston, as we take another look at that one. That's more of a change-up, I thought. It, it, Offerman did a good job of just flipping it back through the middle. So Offerman is aboard, and here is John Ballanton. Offerman during the regular season at 18 steals. If the Red Sox can get out of here with a split, going home to Fenway for a couple of games they will uh, feel very confident that they have done their job and will have their shot against the mighty Cleveland lineup but most feel that their best shot to get a split in these first two games was to win that first one last night with Pedro Martinez on the mound John Ballanton who's throwing error as, uh, as it turned out a very big play Ballanton nonetheless stood his ground at the clubhouse after the ball game did all of the interviews met with all of the members of the press and took all the blame for the play and for the game on his own shoulders Joe well I've always felt one play doesn't win or lose the ball game but there goes Offerman pitch taken and throw down by Alomar got him the high tag by Roberto Alomar Joe Brinkman made the call and Offerman can't believe it well I have to agree with Offerman before I see the replay. It appeared that Offerman was in there and he hit him in the back. And out comes Jimmy Williams now. Well, it was game two last October. 
when uh, Joe Brinkman was in the center of controversy when he was the home plate umpire Joe with Dwight Gooden on the mound and uh, eventually Dwight Gooden got kicked out of the game there was a big controversy about a call at the plate well I, I'm on record as saying that he was safe so we'll just have to see I have not seen the replay we'll all get a look at it together and you can see that he's out excellent call excellent call when when the tag is high like that I mean it always looks like like the guy's safe but it's that close but I, I have to think that he was out looked to me like his foot was not yet on the bag right. when so that Joe Brinkman was, was correct and I was wrong <laughs> I wouldn't go that far <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you owe that man an apology I expect you to sit and write him a letter as soon as this game's over no I've protected him too many other times <laughs> uh oh yeah. now he's He's absolved Brinkman of any blame and then ripped him in the same bread. <laughs> <laughs> two and two of the count to Valentin. Oh, man, nice pitch right in the knees on the outside corner. Strike three call. Good job there by Nagy because what he did was he, he set up in the thing and he was coming inside right over the outside corner. Look at the target. I mean, that's a, just about a perfect the pitches you're going to see tonight. Look at this knee high right over the outside corner. Now Jason Baratek will come up, the switch hitting Red Sox catcher. And this guy became the everyday catcher for Boston. And I think where he really made a mark this year, because they really liked him as a catcher, was how well he did with the bat. And he must have done it because here he is in the biggest games of the year, hitting third in the order in the first two games of this series. He hit 269 with 20 homers and 39 doubles during the regular season two down nobody on but remember they take them Dabak out Dabak was a guy that was really carrying them in the middle of the season there for a while getting a lot of big hits hitting a few home runs driving in a lot of runs and they have taken him out of the lineup today Baracek to left field going back in the ball justice at the wall makes the catch so a leadoff single to the Red Sox but then nothing now the big Cleveland lineup coming up against Saberhagen when we return. Again. Game two of the American League Division Series, the Red Sox and Cleveland Indians. Red Sox nothing. Cleveland is coming up. Mike Hargrove, the, as amazing as it is because of all of the success he's had with this Cleveland ball club, he's somewhat beleaguered as the manager here. They always talk that if Cleveland doesn't go all the way, they get knocked out early, or even if they... They win the title, but don't win it impressively enough that he might be out. Here's the Pepsi Cleveland batting order. Kenny Lofton, center field. Omar Vizquel, shortstop. Roberto Alomar, second base. All fast, all get on base all the time. Then Manny Ramirez, who just cherry picks RBIs, 165 of them. Then Jim Tomey, and he comes up big time in the postseason, as he did last night with a big two-run homer that tied up the ball game in the sixth inning. Harold Baines, the veteran DH, acquired from Baltimore earlier. It'll be Dave Justice, the former Atlanta Brave in left field. Travis Fryman at third base, and Sandy Alomar, the catcher, batting ninth. That on the mound for the Red Sox, the veteran Brett Saberhagen. And uh, Joe, it's almost miraculous what he's been able to do this year with so many problems with his right shoulder. Well, you're exactly right, John. I mean, he is on the disabled list three separate occasions this year, so you know that he had a lot of problems. That's a minimum 45 days right there that he missed. But he has, when he's able to pitch, when he's healthy, he's one of the best pitchers in baseball. He has a good fastball that he spots really well. His control is his main asset. Great control, a curveball, and a changeup. But I think the key for him is how well he's going to be able to get inside on the Indians' left-handed hitters. You cannot pitch their left-handers out over the plate because they will hurt you. Kenny Lofton bluffs the buck, takes a strike. Now, one thing that is almost a given with Saberhagen, he is a guy who will always throw strikes. He walked only 11 hitters the whole year in 119 innings. And about one walk for every 11 innings pitched. Change up too high. And the count, one ball and one strike. He won 10, lost 6, a 2.95 ERA. 81 strikeouts, 11 walks. See, that's the pitch I'm talking about right there on the inside corner. 
These Indians left handed hitters like the ball out over the plate and the first two strikes that he has taken have been on the inside corner. That doesn't mean you throw every pitch in there but you have to keep them honest by going inside. And he's on the inside strike three called and Lofton didn't like the call. Well again this is going to be the key to Saber Hagen's success if he can get that ball right there on the inside corner as he does there he had three pitches right on the inside corner with Lofton Lofton like all the other left handers on this ball club like the ball out over the plate and he got that one in and Lofton thinks the last one was off the plate inside. Lofton who came in with a 405 on base average Vizquel 397 that's a strike to Omar. Switch hitter. Omar hit 333 this year. I mean, the the good field no hit shortstop used to be with Seattle. Right. Something he disappeared when he got to Cleveland. That's short. And the throw by Garcia Para and Vizquel is gone. Two down. And let's take a look at the defense, and they will need to play good defense tonight. And last night, unfortunately for Valentin, he made an error, and then they followed with a home run. So today, the infield will have to play well. And this was not, I mean, it was a routine play. He backs up on it, and his throw is just a little bit. He got just a little bit on top of it, and it's sunk rather than ride across the infield. But, again, I'm not one who believes that just one play always wins or loses the game. I mean, that just tied the score, and they ended up losing later. Roberto Alomar. He had been with Baltimore, came to Cleveland, and has uh, added that little something extra to this Cleveland lineup, hitting in the third spot. He just had a remarkable year, 323 average. He had 24 homers and 120 runs batted in. John, we talked about the beginning of the season. I thought the biggest trade, the biggest change in teams was Roberto Alomar coming here to this ball club. They've been without a definite second baseman. They've been without a guy that could hit at the top of the order, that wouldn't strike out, could always put the ball in play. And with Vizquel and Lofton getting on base, he's the guy. I mean, he's a perfect fit for this lineup. So who is the most valuable player? The guy I, that's who drives in? Is it the guy who drives yeah. in all the runs? Yeah. Or is it the guy who gets on base and uh, creates all those RBIs? I, I, I will discuss that because I think that's a, it's a very tough decision. I, I think this year, whomever wins it, there will be at least four other guys who deserve it as well. I think it, it's, a, it's a tough call this year. You know, a lot of people are saying Pedro Martinez. I think a pitcher should only be the most valuable player in a year when there are not a lot of other great candidates. Because he's going to be the Cy Young Award winner. And that's why they created the Cy Young Award for pitchers. It's kind of like the MVP for pitchers. But I mean, there are so many guys here. I mean, even like you said, on his own team, you have Manny Ramirez, who drove in 165. And a lot of people will say, well, he had a lot of people on in front of him. That's true, but he still picked up 165. That's the, that's like an unbelievable number of RBIs. How about Roberto Alomar, who scored 138 right. and drove in 120 and stole 37 and played the best second base you'll ever see. I think the one other thing. It's funny because everything you say is true, but if when you look at Ramirez, he still hit 337, 44 home runs. I mean, I, I just think it's a tough call. If, if I, you know what I'd do if I was voting? I'd vote for both of them. I'd split it. Yeah, you know what I'd do? I'd vote for Ivan Rodriguez. <laughs> that one to the wall. It's off the wall. The carom played by O'Leary. Alomar into second with a sliding double. Well, before we go any further, let me finish that. You were talking about the Cleveland guys. I wasn't talking about the whole league. We were talking about the Cleveland guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Since we're in Cleveland. No, I, I you know, Yvonne Rodriguez, there's so many deserving players. This is why Alomar is so good. He fought off so many good pitches from Saber Hagen, and then Saber Hagen got one in the middle of the plate, and he pounded it. But that's what a good hitter will do. When a guy gets ahead of you, you fight off the great pitches that the pitcher makes and hope that he makes a mistake. And in that case, Alomar waited, and he got a good pitch to hit, and he drove it off the wall. Yeah, I'm splitting my vote between Ivan Rodriguez and Rafael Palmero. That's, see, that's the other point. I mean, you're, you you kind of hung me out there, but I thought you were just talking about this team. <laughs> that's too high to Manny Ramirez. But that'll see how you could not vote for Manny Ramirez. He hit, as you mentioned, 333. Yeah. 
hundred sixty five RBI that's the most since Jimmy Fox in the thirties and when those runners were in scoring position he picked them up. I mean he didn't just hit a bunch of fly balls and ground balls he hit three eighty six with men in scoring position. It's a, I mean it's an unbelievable situation I mean and then if you go over to Texas you look at Yvonne Rodriguez you look at uh, Rafael Palmero then you go and look at Derek Jeter I mean there are just so many guys that are deserving of the award this year and Garcia Parra of course with, with, that with, with Boston I mean this is an unbelievable year is what it is I changed my mind I'm going with Garcia Parra <laughs> Chuck Nando Manny Ramirez big strong right handed swing one ball one strike that's too high that's the, the other thing when you're a hitter in this Cleveland lineup it's not like they can afford to pitch around you it's not right. like throwing four pitches in the dirt to Chipper Jones right and then taking your chances I mean you got four other guys behind Ramirez who could have hurt you big time Tommy's on deck then Baines David Justice Travis Fryman a perennial hundred RBI man is hitting eighth in this order two and one the count to Manny Ramirez Roberto Alomar got it started with a two out double same. on that inside same as I was talking before he has to be able to get the ball inside Every one of these Indians hitters likes the ball out over the plate. And if you can spot the fastball inside, you'll get a lot of call strikes. Then you have to make a good pitch to finish them off. But they do like the ball out over the plate. Time granted at home plate, just to Saberhagen, who was looking back at second at the moment, started to deliver. Well that was interesting because Alomar was actually bothering him there too. And he may have made a mistake if he'd have gone to the plate because Alomar had taken his attention away from Ramirez. And that's what base dealers do. They take some of your attention away and you don't give 100% concentration to Manny Ramirez. You're going to get hurt. So I give Alomar credit there. He did distract Saberhagen a lot on that particular pitch before he threw it. Did Alomar distract Manny Ramirez at the same time? No, not unless he not unless he really breaks. There's Alomar with his lead. The pitch is fouled back to the screen. Two balls, two strike. Now, in this first inning, we know Saberhagen's got that pinpoint fastball with a little oomph on it. He's got an excellent changeup, but he also has a big time curveball. Curve ball. But uh, we haven't seen much of that at least yet. Well, the last time I saw Saberhagen, his curveball was breaking big, but it wasn't as fast. And the guys had a chance to check, you know, they stride and then hold their hands back a little bit. I think he's very effective with the fastball and the changeup. Fastball got him. He blew it past him. So Brett Saberhagen with a strong first inning. Roberto Alomar stranded at second. On the other hand, he threw 20 pitches in that first inning. We'll keep a close eye on that pitch count. Saber Hagen only has 85-90 in it. Garcia Parra coming up. October baseball from Jacobs Field. Like Atlanta, this is a place where it seems like they always play October baseball. No more Garcia Parra. And he pulls it foul down the left field line. Now, it was interesting. The Red Sox do not have a whole lot of sock in their attack no. outside of Nomar and having come from Atlanta where we saw the Astros pitching around Chipper Jones it was kind of surprising last night with Pedro Martinez on the mound in particular where Cleveland did not figure to score much Garcia Parra his first at bat hit a home run against Bartolo Colon his second at bat he had a double and eventually scored another run and he was the offense for the, the Red Sox in that early part of the game but Cleveland eventually against the Boston bullpen came back to win so here's Garcia Parra. Mike Hargrove says that he doesn't believe in just going out and walking a guy and putting a guy on base like that. He says it, it, the point is to pitch around a guy when he's in an RBI right. situation. So I don't think you can walk guys when they lead off the inning because you're just asking for trouble a big inning. Because even if he hits a home run right now, it's only one run. And if you walk him and the in inning escalates, before you know it, you've given up three or four runs. Now, when you're in an RBI situation, I think, you know, you do have to be a little more careful. But I just don't like, I would not like to walk a guy leading off an inning. Andrew said there comes a time when you have to pitch to people no matter how good they are. Right. One and two. Slow chop to short. That's Vizcal. Oh, man, he almost beat it. Vizcal didn't seem like he had a whole lot on that throw. And Garcia Parra really hustled up the line. 
Well, Garcia Parr always gets down the line very well. And and what happened there was Vizquel kind of waited for the ball. Then he did try to rush. He snapped throw. Watch. He snaps. He sees he's going. Now he has to rush. So he didn't have time to really gather himself and get a lot of strength behind it. See, he's in a, he would have liked to have taken one more step to throw it, but he didn't have the time. Now Troy O'Leary and a curveball in there for a called strike. Now the Red Sox have other power besides Nomar and uh, O'Leary had 28 homers had 103 runs batted in 280 batting average he slams one foul down the right field line they also have Mike Stanley who's behind O'Leary with 19 homers Veritek the catcher had 20 O'Leary broke his bat apparently on that you know uh, Joe the this talk about the MVP I know I've at first said Ivan Rodriguez Right, and then Ivan Rodriguez won Gonzalez, and then I changed to Alomar, and then I. No, you didn't have Gonzalez, and you have Palmero. Oh, the Palmero, that's right. right. Well, what about Juan Gonzalez? Oh, uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, and some people think Pedro, but right. I'm thinking with this Red Sox lineup, they don't have all of that that slugging talent in there. Garcia Parra really shines out. Where are they without him? I might have to go Garcia Parra. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I changed my mind again. As O'Leary gets a base hit in the center. Well, you know what you are? You're probably like all the voters. They cannot decide. They're probably just going to get the six or seven guys and throw them up in the air and pick one. And, yeah. and, he, and then whenever you do it, I mean, you're not going to be wrong in any case. No, I've decided on Garcia Parra. Oh, okay. I'm, well, you're not going to be Except, I, I, you know, Derek Jeter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You're not going to be you're not going to be wrong in any case. I mean, look what Jeter did for yeah. the Yankees. Right. And I mean, I think maybe Jeter's a little better shortstop right now than Garcia Parra. Right. Okay, so never mind. I'm going with Jeter. <laughs> Cuz I mean, they finished ahead of the the Red Sox. True. If I wasn't already going for Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Man, right. I could not go for Rodriguez. That's what I tell you, this may be the most difficult MVP year to vote I mean it may be I mean uh, there have been a lot of great players play this game but I don't know if there have ever been this many that was as, as deserving as as the six or seven that are playing now Mike Stanley the hitter that's a called strike and of course we're talking about that right here in this playoff game because we have so many candidates right I mean this Cleveland lineup is like an all-star team uh, one way to get maybe extra votes in this Cleveland lineup for MVP is where they hit you in the lineup. I mean if uh, you know, Jim Tomey hit where Ramirez hit or you know, David Justice uh, if he can stay healthy enough to play every day. Who knows how many they drive in hitting in that spot behind those those guys who get on base so much. There's only been I guess one tie in the MVP voting. Willie Stargell and uh, Keith Hernandez. 79. And that was a tough decision there, too, because Willie Stargell's team won the world championship. You know, his team actually won the National League pennant. That's hit hard to third. Fryman to second one. And on the first. Double play. Five to four to three. One hit. Nobody left. The Red Sox have put two men on in the first two innings and have had both of them wiped out on the base pass. Jim Tomey is coming up. No score. Jacobs Field in Cleveland. The Red Sox nothing. Cleveland nothing. Last of the second inning and that's the view. The beautiful aerial view of the Jake from the Goodyear blimp over the past 75 years. Millions have watched the Goodyear blimps hovering over special events. Today it's the spirit of Akron carrying on that proud Goodyear tradition. You can find out more about the Goodyear Blimp fleet on the internet. Just like my good friend Joe Morgan, he'll be checking it out at www.goodyear.com. Let's look inside. I like, it's one of my favorite ballparks, Joe, because it's not only a beautiful place to watch a ball game and a fun place, but it gives you that real spectacular view of the downtown skyline. That's yeah, a beautiful ballpark. They did a great job here in Cleveland with the Jake. It's a, it's a jewel in this city, and it, it celebrates the city all at the same time. Here's Jim Tomey. Man, he's one of those guys, Joe. He goes up there, and it, it just looks like he should hit one 500 feet every time. Yeah, he definitely doesn't get cheated. And I talked to him before the game today and asked him, I said, you had to be looking for that pitch last night. And he said, yes, because I was watching him on TV. You know, I was watching the game. Pops it up. Soaring, majestic pop-up. 
taller than the terminal tower here in Cleveland. Caught by Nomar Garcia Parra. One away. Well, this is the home run you're talking about, Joe. Now watch this first pitch. He hasn't even seen the pitch from low. And it's a breaking ball, and he just hammers it out of the ballpark. And what made it so hard for me to understand was Lowe was throwing more sinkers. He wasn't really throwing the curveball early in the count. He was throwing a lot of sinkers, and he was looking for it, and he drilled it. Harold Baines, the veteran, just a, a, a great professional hitter, and at 40 years of age, he'd been having maybe his best all-round year this year. 312 average, 25 homers, 103 batted in. Base hit. Breaks that one in the right field. The second Cleveland hit. Like I say, he can he can probably hit until he's 50, John. I mean, because he doesn't use a lot of effort. Now watch, not a lot of effort in this swing. Look at this. Just a, look at that. Just smooth line drive to right field for a base hit. I mean, look at that. Not a lot of energy. He was fooled a little bit, but he kept the bat level through the hitting zone and lined it to right field. Looked like it was a changeup or something, a little off speed. So Baines aboard. Don't look for him to try and steal. David Justice. So I'm giving the fans a little scouting report now. What? A little inside info. I think most of the people knew you couldn't steal. <laughs> I don't. I wonder when the last time he did steal a base. Uh, you're exposing me as a fraud now. <laughs> <laughs> It may have been four or five years since he's stolen the base. Some kid out there watching for the first time who just heard of Harold Baines today. Well, you see they're playing behind him, not so much because of they, they don't expect him to steal, but they don't want Justice to pull a ground ball through the hole on the right side either. David Justice, 287, 21 homers, 88 runs batted in this year. No score, last of the second. Brett Saberhagen. And that's a foul into the upper deck off the left field line. Well, you know, Brett Saberhagen, 1984, he was 20 years old. And he was the youngest ever to start in a league championship series. The next year, at age 21, he was the World Series most valuable player. Kansas City ended up beating St. Louis in that series. But then he would not get to the postseason again for 10 years. It was 1995 when he was with Colorado before he got there again. Fastball a little bit high. Back in 1985, I mean, he was something at, at that time. Yes. 2 and 0, 0.5 earned run average. He had a complete game shutout in the deciding seventh game. I mean, what did you enjoy? He threw 97 miles an hour, great curve, great changeup. The difference between him now is the velocity, because he always had great control. This could be two. Good one there. Garcia power to first. Double play. Interesting feed there by Offerman. No score after two innings from Cleveland. Red Sox nothing, Cleveland nothing as we go to the third inning here in Cleveland. Now tonight, the American League Division Series from New York will continue. The Rangers looking to get even with the Yankees. That game will be carried on Fox at 8 Eastern. Then join us tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 Pacific, for Atlanta and Houston Game 3 from the Astrodome. Kevin Millwood's one hitter got the Braves even in the series yesterday. Tomorrow, Tom Glavin up against Mike Hampton. Quite a matchup there. And uh, tomorrow night, the Diamondbacks and Mets at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific from New York on NBC. Butch Husky, the former Met, against Charles Nagy in the shadows here in Cleveland. One ball, one strike. Husky in there instead of Brian Dawback. Husky hit 282 this year, 22 homers, 77 batted in. All around, probably his best year with the bat. Curveball was pretty close. One ball, one strike. Now you're heading off to, to New York. Yes, I get to see the Mets again with the Diamondbacks. All right. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting matchup. Two and one the count. Husky right to Roberto Alomar. Hit it hard, but right to the Cleveland second baseman. One away. Now Trot Nixon will come up. Late, late, late. I mean, very late last night here in the Eastern Time Zone. Actually, very early this morning. The Diamondbacks defeated the New York Mets 7-1 to one at Bank One Ballpark. Low and inside for ball one. 
and a very strong performance, maybe the best ever in the postseason from Todd Stottlemyre. Really came up big time for the Diamondbacks to get his ball club even, and, and really a must win for Arizona. Yes, it was, but not only that, John, here's a guy that's been injured, and you do not know if he's going to be able to go four innings, five innings, or what you're going to get out of him, and he gave him just a great performance and held them until they were able to score some runs for him. 2 and 0. Oh. And that is too low. 3 and 0. Oh. Damon Buford is on deck. Again, the story concerning the injury to Pedro Martinez, not real positive for the Red Sox right now. He's got a muscle strain uh, near the left shoulder in the back. That one is past Tommy down the line. And uh, Trot Nixon has a stand-up double swinging away on 3-0. and Well, a lot of times you swing 3-0, and you're supposed to try to get an extra base hit. I mean, you don't let a guy swing 3-0 and with no one on base just to hit a little single to left field. So Trot is trying to hit the ball hard. He pulls it, and he hits it down the line, and he gets a double. Tommy made a dive for it, but just out of his reach. And by the time Ramirez gets it back in, Trot Nixon has a double. So let him hit 3-0, and at least got him one extra base. Now here is Damon Buford. He is the progeny of a former major leaguer, the curveball for a strike and it is 0-1. Buford, the son of longtime major leaguer Don Buford. And Damon is an excellent center fielder, runs real well. I'm hoping that he might be able to get something going here against Charles Nagy today. 0-2 the count. Off from in the leadoff band is on deck. I thought it was interesting, John, when asked, Jimmy Williams was asked in the question and answer session about what brought him to the decision he came to to take Daubach out of the lineup and also to take Darren Lewis out. And he just said, managerial decision. <laughs> so then we said, what were the underlying factors as to the manager's decision being made that way and uh, is it just, just something I decided to try <laughs> so I asked him I said well, did you have kind of a hunch did he have good numbers against this guy yeah thought we'd see how it go <laughs> well you got more out of him than the, they did at the press conference <laughs> but he's made a lot of wise decisions this year I mean he's been able to bring a team that most of us thought would not finish, you know, that high, or at least wouldn't even be able to win the wild card without the presence of Mo Vaughn in the lineup. Yeah. I mean, but they had a better record this year without Mo than they had last year when they won the wild card. And I think this is the area, the time of the year they would miss him most, though, John. When you get to the playoffs and you start, you have the best pitchers on the other teams pitching against you, you need that extra bat in the lineup and at least a bat that can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Struck him out with the breaking ball. So Buford is gone. Out number two. Now, as most people look at the Boston lineup and say there's just not a lot of power there. And that's when they miss him the most. And there's a splitter right toward the outside corner. And Buford way out in front. You watch this pitch is off mm. the plate. But it started towards the outside corner and Buford committed a little too quickly and wasn't able to stop his swing. So the Red Sox getting a man into scoring position for the first time, but Buford unable to get him home. Two down. Now Offerman will give it a shot. Offerman, although he hit at the top of the order all year, drove in 69 runs. So he did pretty well in this kind of a situation. Offerman hit 279 for the year with men in scoring position. Fastball too high from Charles Nagy. One ball, no strikes. No score in the game in the third inning. Three to two final here last night. Cleveland winning it in the ninth inning on a bases loaded single by Travis Fryman. That one is in the right field, a base hit. Now Ramirez has got a strong arm. Here comes the throw. And it's cut off by Tommy, and they've got Offerman. Tagged out by Miscal, and the inning is over. But. Trot Nixon comes in to score, and the Red Sox have gone ahead on the clutch two-out single by Offerman. One to nothing, Boston, after two and a half.
And here we'll show you another example of the good Cleveland defense, even though they do give up a run here. Offerman gets a base hit to right field. Now, the throw will be coming in, but watch Roberto Alomar where he ends up. A lot of times the throw will come in, the first baseman cuts it off, but no one's at first base so he could get back. And in this case, Alomar was at first base, so there was no place for Offerman to go. Because you always round the bag and try to get away, but it was a good play by Roberto Alomar to sneak behind him. Travis Ryman, the hitter. One ball, one strike. See where Alomar is? That keeps this guy from going back. Because that's the only guy that could keep him from going back. So a good job there by Alomar to back up the play. And Fryman, last night's ultimate hero in the ninth inning with his bases loaded single. The count goes to two and one to Travis. This was his worst year as a big leaguer. He had all kinds of uh, injury problems. Fryman spent 80 days on the disabled list. He was on the list once for a back problem. Then he suffered a torn ligament in his right knee. And he is not at full capability even yet. But as Mike Hargrove said, he likes having even 90% of Travis Fryman over a lot of other guys. So Travis is in there and he delivered last night for them in the clutch. Three and one the count. Look at that. A walk. Brett Saberhagen issuing a walk. Let's go to our spotlight reporter, Rick Sutcliffe. Well, John, when Saber Hagen can't extend, he's got to keep loose. He keeps stretching. You watch him move his arms, and that's what's keeping him going right now. He's got that want-to in his eyes. He looks a lot like Todd Stoudemire in the game last night. Stoudemire's not 100%, but he's effective. See the ball's up in his own? Watch him stretch right there. Look at him take that left shoulder back. I've got to get loose. Now he's stretching both arms, and when he gets it loose and he gets it right, ask Manny Ramirez. He's tough. Yeah, he blew Manny Ramirez away with a man in scoring position to win the first inning. John, I saw a note. I can't seem to find it now. He had not walked a leadoff hitter for something like three months or something. I mean, I can't believe it. I mean, it, but I can't find the note. He had not walked any of the last 111 leadoff men in an inning that he had faced. Glad you could find that note. I could but I'd read it someplace. I knew it was an astronomical number. Right. If he had not walked a leadoff hitter, I mean, that's amazing, John. I, I, I guess it was your note, but I... You stole it. I, I don't know. That's I okay. That's okay. <laughs> We're, we work together. You work together. You can have it back. Now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm really... <laughs> but that is pretty amazing. Yeah. 111 straight batters. I mean, if you, if you pitched a nine-inning game, of course, it'd be nine leadoff men. Yeah. So what would that be? That'd be uh, nine, uh, 12, 12 consecutive nine 12, inning yeah. games, right? Yeah. Yeah. So a, that's, that's a couple of months worth of complete games. It's amazing. 0 oh, and two the count to Sandy Alomar. He also spent much of this season in the disabled. Just only played 37 games. He's wearing a very bulky-looking brace on his left knee. You can see it there protruding beneath his pant leg. Curveball from Saberhagen. It's one of the few he's attempted here. Yeah. One there's and a, two. There's a little difference in the hitters, the hitting styles. If you go through the, the Cleveland lineup and you try to figure out which ones you could use the breaking ball on, it would be Travis Fryman and, and Sandy Alomar. Those are the two guys you probably want to use a curveball on more than, say, Lofton, Alomar, and Ramirez. A ball and two strikes. Runner at first. Two and two. That's ball missing. Lead off man Kenny Lofton on deck. Remember Derek Lowe worked four innings last night because of the injury that took Pedro Martinez out of the game. Lowe has been one of the top Red Sox relievers. Particularly against Cleveland. I mean he's been murder on the Cleveland lineup. And he will not be used today according to Jimmy Williams. Double play ball to short. Garcia Perry. The second for one. And the relay by Offerman. Hit him off the bat. So Offerman, who is not your classic second baseman and uh, often has trouble turning that double play, and we saw it illustrated right there. Well, this should have been a routine double play. You see, he had plenty of time, but what happened, he threw leaning back, so the ball, you know, was released high. 
and he wasn't able. He has plenty of time. You got Sandy Alomar Jr. running. You see, he's not even close. He's three steps away from the bag, but Stanley can't get back down in time before Alomar gets there. But that's a routine double play that you know you normally feel that you're going to make in a big league game. Now Kenny Lofton, Alomar at first. He chased that high fastball and didn't get it. Lofton was caught out on strikes his first time. That's a another point, Joe. Here's this Red Sox team. They have a very small margin for error. Exactly. Especially against a strong club. And this is a club that's built basically on, on pitching and defense. Yeah. You know, I mean, there is offense there, but it's not that big time offense you see from the other American League postseason teams. Nice pitch right on the outside. It, it is 0 2. I mean, they really can't afford these little slip ups. Last night, look what happened on the routine looking play to Valentin. The throwing error. Stanley can't handle it. The low throw. The next batter, boom, two run homer. Well, you're right. You cannot afford to give the Indians an extra out. I mean, this should be two down and nobody on right now. He got a made-to-order double play ball from a guy who figures to hit a lot of double play balls. Yeah, Alomar Jr. doesn't run well, and especially with the bad knee and that big brace on it, he's not going to run well. And that's why I say he had plenty of time, but, you know, it just happens, and he was not a good throw to first base. 0-2 oh, the count to Lofton. Omar Vizquel on deck. Very high. One ball, two strike. Well, we saw him pitch Lofton inside the first time up, and you can see why, because Lofton, even though he's not that far from the plate, he still goes in a little bit. The one thing is, Lofton eventually will look for the ball inside. And the changeup miss, two and two to Kenny Lofton. Saber Hagen, who says that it's about a 100% certainty that he will have surgery done at the end of the season on his shoulder. He had so much surgery there, John. I, I just wonder how much. What is there? Done. Yeah, how much more can you do? I mean, at one time he snapped two ligaments in his right shoulder, and it was a career-threatening injury. Beautiful. Ooh. Just missed over the outside part of the plate. It looked very similar to what was called strike two in the same at bat. That's his 45th pitch thrown already. After only two of the third innings. We'll keep an eye on Sandy Alomar with a three and two count at first base. He is running. Alomar went up after what might have been ball four there. A high fastball and he fouled it. Anytime you put a runner in motion, you put a little more pressure on the defense. Someone has to cover second base, and everyone else has to shorten up a little bit. So you're opening up a smaller, a bigger hole than would be there if you let him stay at first base. Alomar was running in the previous pitch. Three and two. There goes Sandy. And a pop-up foul. Again, he chased that high fastball. He's not been able to lay off it here. Against Saberhagen, three balls, two strikes. Saberhagen had that career-threatening injury years and years ago to his right shoulder. The reconstructive surgery required practically reattaching the shoulder. I mean, it was just a nightmare. But he made a remarkable, almost miraculous recovery from that. And it's a, a long, again, a long list of, of surgeries. Runner going, and again, this time on a changeup. Lofton fouling it back. Saberhagen has had three shoulder surgeries, two elbow surgeries, and one knee surgery. As well as being on the disabled list three times this year. Twice for a strained right shoulder, once for a laceration to his left foot. This is the tenth pitch of this at bat. Alomar runs and it's ball four. So the pitch count is mounting. And Saberhagen, who averaged one walk for every 11 innings pitch this year, has walked two in this inning. And Joe Kerrigan, the Red Sox pitching coach, will go out to the mound to talk to Saberhagen. Well, that, that in itself will tell you that there's a little something wrong. He doesn't feel as comfortable that he did at the beginning of the ball game because, you know, he just doesn't walk a lot of hitters. And he threw about four straight balls before Lofton took the fourth, you know, took a base on balls.
soon for the Red Sox. The untimely injury to their ace Pedro Martinez last night that may well have ended up costing them the game. As you see that Sabre again amazingly less than one walk per nine innings pitched. Anything below two walks or even at two walks is X-ray. Yeah. Two men on, one man on, and it's starting to get dangerous. Red Sox lead one to nothing, but here is Omar Vizquel, Roberto Alomar on deck. Popped him up. Foul. Coming back is Veritek, but it is out of play. 0-1. John, you mentioned last night's ball game for the Red Sox. They actually took a double whammy because if they would have just lost the game with Pedro, they would still have the low, Derek Lowe left. And he is, you know, their best pitcher coming out of the bullpen in long relief. But they lost the game, they lost Pedro, and they used Derek Lowe. So that's a double whammy as far as I'm concerned. If you just go and lose with Pedro, you still have a guy. And they, they lost two guys that were very valuable to him and still lost the ball game. Change up, up and away. That's the 51st pitch thrown by Saberhagen. All but 11 of them have been fastballs. And we've seen, I don't know, one or two curveballs. There's Sandy Alomar at second. Kenny Lofton at first. On the inside, he got the call. A strike two, and Biscal was not happy about it. One ball, two strikes. And as you mentioned, it's the second strike on the inside corner. Biscal not happy, as was Lofton in the first inning on an inside fastball. Two men on via base on balls. That one is hit deep down the right field line. Into the corner, it is off the base of the wall. Alomar scores. Lofton right behind him. It's a triple for Vizquel. Triple on Cleveland. And John, the missed double play made more of a difference than people realize because he would have been pitching to Lofton from the windup rather than the stretch, which made a little difference. And I mean, now they've gotten two runs. And you're just constantly under pressure when you're a pitcher and you're pitching against this powerful lineup of the Cleveland Indians. And any little mistake just doubles the stress you're under. The infield comes in for Roberto Alomar. And here's Saberhagen. With the, the aching right shoulder, the frayed rotator cuff, and he is in one of those hellacious innings here at the Jake. And you might as well just count this run. I mean, you're not going to strike Roberto Alomar out in this situation. Too low. Alomar ripped a double off the left field wall his first time. Vizquel, who hit four triples in the regular season, getting one just over the glove of Trot Nixon here. For a big postseason triple. Remember, Vizquel hitting second had 66 RBIs. Ooh, the fastball by. Two and one. Well, last night, and I, I don't mean to belabor the point on Valentin, but the error and Cleveland puts two on the board one pitch later and now the missed double play and there's two runs on the board just like that. Well the problem is you're at a disadvantage when you're playing the Indians anyway so you just have to play almost a perfect game to beat them. That changeup catches the outside. Alomar didn't think so. Two balls two strikes. And on top of all of that two walks in the inning by Saberhagen only two times all year did he have a game where he walked more than one. To the count. 29 pitches thrown in this inning, including 10 to Kenny Lofton. That one is cracked down the right field line. Nixon on the run. That's in there. He'll have to go chase it. Alomar has gotten Vizquel home. Another double for Roberto Alomar, his second of the game. Three to one, Cleveland. You're in a situation, if you're Brett Saberhagen with Alomar, you really do not have a pitch to strike him out with because he's going to fight off the change-ups the other way. So what he does is he tries to fire fastball up and in, and Alomar is very quick, and he rips it to right field. Now watch, he tries to go up and in. You see the target, and he's still able to get up and get on that ball. 
So there was no way that he really just didn't have a pitch to get Alomar out with in that situation. I don't say get him out, but keep him from putting the ball in play. Now Manny Ramirez again with a man in scoring position. And here at Jacobs Field, the Cleveland fans can sense the Cleveland Indians going for the jugular. The curveball hit high in the air to right center. Lifting over. Beautiful. The other warning track. Roberto Alomar tags up at second and goes over to third. Two down. John, let's take a look at the ball that Vizquel hit. It tried Nixon may have lost the ball. Let's see, he gets over there. No, the ball's just over his head. That was, he gave it a good try. He almost got there. You see him running. He got a pretty good jump on it. He almost gets there, but he can't quite make the play. And Vizquel ends up with a triple and two RBIs. And Roberto Alomar drives him in with a double. And it's three to one favoring the Indians. But they just keep you under constant pressure. I mean, here he is again. He's got to run at third. You have Jim Tomey standing in the batter's box. Tomey popped up to short his first time. A changeup for a call strike. The Boston bullpen is busy. As Brett Saberhagen, this is exactly what Jimmy Williams and the Red Sox did not want to see happen. For Saberhagen to have one of these horrible, nightmarish, high pitch innings, high stress innings. Fastball just missing inside. As Rick Suckler pointed out, after every pitch you see, Saberhagen stretching it out a little bit, stretching out that shoulder a little bit. There's John Wasden, the right-hander up in the bullpen. It's 33 pitches in this inning now for Saberhagen. Change up in the dirt. Juno, let's go to Rick Sutcliffe. John, Robbie Alomar can beat you in so many ways. Not only two doubles this afternoon against Saberhagen, but in those two at-bats, it's taken Saberhagen 14 pitches to get the doubles out of Alomar. And because of that, his day is almost over. Well, interesting point, Rick. Roberto Alomar, who's one of those guys he'll make it throw a lot of pitches. He'll take a walk, foul off tight wins. That's ball too high. So it goes on. Well, I think he's at a, in a situation now, like I say, where he was trying to get Alomar to chase a high pitch and strike out. Now he just tried it with Jim Tomey. But I, you're right, I don't know how much he has left because he has thrown a lot of pitches under pressure. And another walk. He has walked three in the same inning. This from a pitcher who walked 11 in the whole season. Now Harold Baines, the eighth hitter of the inning. And out to the mound, Varitek, there he comes into the picture to talk to Saberhagen. Harold Baines, a lefty. Justice on deck, a lefty. So even if Jimmy Williams would like to get him out of there right now, it's, it's a tough time to do it with these lefties up. Yeah. But it's also a tough time to be out there trying to get Harold Baines out if you don't have your pinpoint control. Baines single to right his first time. That one is hit deep in the right center field. Trot Nixon is going back. Still going back and it's gone. Home run Harold Baines. It's a five run inning. So many weapons, there's not a lot you can do, if, and especially if you're saving out there without your best stuff and without your pinpoint control. I mean, it's just too many weapons to try to wade through. Fastball, middle of the plate, down, and Baines puts a charge into it in the right center field. Baines is such a great low ball hitter anyway. Well, he can hit all pitches, but I mean, he really can drive the low pitch, and you see the Indians bench very excited. I mean, uh, they had lost a lot of games this year to the Red Sox, but now they're leading six to one here in the third inning. Yeah, I, I shorted him. I was only giving him five, six runs in on the three-run homer by Harold Baines. Wasden coming in, one pitch too late. 
David Justice, the hitter, taking a called strike one from John Wasden. Justice, the ninth man to bat in this inning. He grinded into a double play to end the second inning. And, of course, double plays turned and not turned is turned into a theme of this ball game. And a change up for a strike is almost like a, a, a foreshadowing of the missed double play here in the third. A poor feed by Jose Offerman on Justice's double play ball in the second inning. Offerman flipped the ball rather uh, poorly to Garcia Parra. A low toss, but Garcia Parra handled it and got the double play. But then it was Offerman, the middleman, on the pivot for the double play in this inning that might have precluded all of this from happening. And he made a poor throw to first. They did not get the double play. Instead of two down and nobody on a Lofton coming up. One out, one on. Lofton had that 10 pitch at bat with Saber Hagen still on the stretch, as you pointed out, Joe. That's into right field. Going back, Nixon in front of the wall, and he makes the catch. Slams into the wall, bounces off. And although it rattled his bones, he held on to it. Another explosion from the Cleveland Indians. Six to one, Cleveland. A six-run inning for Cleveland. It is now six to one, Cleveland over the Red Sox as we head to the fourth inning. John Ballantin, Jason Baratek, and Nomar Garcia Para against Charles Nagy. By the way, even with his slugging Cleveland attack, that is the most that Cleveland has ever scored in its history in a postseason game. Ballantin, it's a high fly ball to the left center. Runs ever for Cleveland in a single inning in a postseason game. John, you're in a situation when you're playing the Indians where you just cannot make any mistakes. You can't give them any extra outs. Now, this obviously should have been a double play, but I felt like Offerman was leaning back and he throws it over the top. Because Offerman has been a shortstop a lot of times, he's played a lot of different positions. You know, a, he doesn't throw like a normal second baseman because he's got a strong arm. Other second baseman would come sidearm or flip it. But he threw it over the top and he, you know, it just got behind, got on top, got didn't get on top of it, and the ball sailed on him. And when you're playing these Indians, you just have to play a flawless game, especially when you're the underdog. And so far in this series, they haven't been able to do that. Jason Veracek into right center field. Ramirez and Lofton. It is Ramirez. And that is out number two. So Veracek is 0 for 2. Well, at the point of that would-be double play. In the third inning, Saberhagen had thrown 11 pitches in the inning and 39 for the game. And of course, he would not have had to have been in the stretch for Kenny Lofton, who came up next. Everything would have been entirely different. As it turned out, after that missed double play, he threw 26 more pitches in that inning. And uh, until finally, 65 pitches into it, he had nothing left. And was removed probably one pitch too late. Well, I don't think there's any doubt it was one pitch too late. But the other point is, when you're a guy with a you know bad arm or you're struggling out there, the more pitches you have to throw in an inning, the less you have as the inning goes along. Now, when you go down and sit down, you have a you know you know your palm, you have a tendency to regroup. Now you go back out there and you start all over again. But it's like a guy who has a, a leg injury. If you just run between first and second, you're okay. But once you have to go all the way to third on a, on a single, that's when it starts to catch up with you because it gets weaker. There's a splitter in the dirt to Nomar Garcia Para. One ball, two strikes. Nomar grounded the shortest first time. Two down, nobody on in the fourth inning. And, and, and make no mistake about it. I mean, Boston is trying to do something that maybe no one else is going to be able to do in the postseason either, and that's to beat the Cleveland Indians and to beat them at home. The splitter in the dirt, he struck him out, tagged out by Sandy Alomar. So Nagy, after being staked to a 6-1 to lead, has an eight-pitch, three-up, three-down inning. 6-1 to Cleveland after three and a half. Cleveland six, the Red Sox one, as we go to the last of the fourth inning here at Jacobs Field, game two of this American League Division Series. Then later, more action coming up on Saturday. The four games played on Saturday, two of them right here on ESPN and ESPN2 at 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 Pacific. The Braves and Astros game four. And at the same time, the Diamondbacks and Mets game four from Shea on ESPN2. Then at 4 o'clock Eastern, Cleveland and the Red Sox game three from Fenway Park on NBC, uh, rather on Fox. And then at 7.30 Eastern, the Yankees 
and the Rangers game four on NBC. to Travis Fryman. He led off the third inning with a walk that started a six-run rally for Cleveland. The Indians, of course, scored more runs than any major league team since 1950 this year. A thousand nine runs, which is kind of astounding. About 6.2 runs a game. Too high. He was at in 1950 score over the Boston Red Sox. And you got to remember they were only playing 154 games then. Well, I'm not saying Cleveland did equal to what Boston no. did, but okay. in fact, Boston didn't have a designated hitter then either. That's 1950. True. Three and zero the count. It's too high, ball four. But in fact, the Red Sox 1950. Hit over 300 as a team to generate over a thousand runs in offense. And you see some of the uh, amazing statistical references to this awesome offensive outpouring by Cleveland this year, and uh, they were not just hitting for power, not just flexing their muscles, but they stole bases. They put a lot of pressure on a, on a pitching staff and on a defense in many different ways. That's a called strike to Sandy Alomar. This Cleveland ball club had five players who had on base percentages of better than 400, which is amazing. That doesn't include Vizquel, who's at 397. So oh, virtually a sixth guy at 400. They were only the ninth team in Major League history, the eighth in this century, to have five guys with 400 on base percentages. Yeah, a lot of teams consider themselves lucky they got you know, hey, a leadoff man. One, and, yeah. <laughs> the leadoff guys are 400. Well, that's pretty right, good. That is pretty good. And they had five guys there. And that 1950 Red Sox team was one of those. Ted Williams, Johnny Pesky, Billy Goodman, Al Zarilla, Dominic DiMaggio. 39 Yankees, one of the highest scoring teams in history. You know, the Yankees had three different teams, Joe. The three highest scoring teams of all time. Averaging just a little bit below seven runs per game. And in three different teams. I mean, in a 154 game schedule, they scored 1,067 runs. It's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. And that was uh, the, the Yankees of Ruth and Gehrig, and then later the, the DiMaggio Yankees in the late 30s. You mentioned somebody with the Red Sox is dear to me, and that's Billy Goodman. They call him Chicken Wing, the original Chicken Wing. It was because he didn't throw very well. <laughs> <You> mean, <laughs> <laughs> I could see that he was a, a very close friend of yours. Yeah, well, uh, they call mine the chicken wings for you know, the flapping elbow, it. The elbow flat. But yeah, but Billy Goodman, who was my, one of my first minor league coaches, he and uh, Dave. Cleveland 6, the Red Sox 1 as we go to the last of the fourth inning here at Jacobs Field, game two of this American League Division Series. Then later, more action coming up on Saturday. Four games played on Saturday, two of them right here on ESPN and ESPN2 at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 Pacific. The Braves and Astros game four. And at the same time, the Diamondbacks and Mets game four from Shea on ESPN2. Then at 4 o'clock Eastern, Cleveland and the Red Sox game three from Fenway Park on NBC, uh, rather on Fox. And then at 7.30 Eastern, the Yankees and the Rangers game four on NBC. to Travis Fryman. He led off the third inning with a walk that started a six-run rally for Cleveland. The Indians, of course, scored more runs than any major league team since 1950 this year. A thousand nine runs, which is it's kind of astounding. About 6.2 runs a game. It's too high. He was at in 1950 score over the Boston Red Sox. And you got to remember, they were only playing 154 games then. Well, I'm not saying Cleveland did equal to what Boston no. did, but in fact, Boston didn't have a designated hitter then either That's in 1950. True. 3 0 the count. It's too high, ball four. But in fact, the Red Sox, 1950, 
hit over 300 as a team to generate over a thousand runs in offense. You see some of the uh, amazing statistical references to this awesome offensive outpouring by Cleveland this year. And uh, they were not just hitting for power, not just flexing their muscles, but they stole bases. They put a lot of pressure on a, on a pitching staff and on a defense in many different ways. That's a called strike to Sandy Alomar. This Cleveland ball club had five players who had on base percentages of better than 400. Which is amazing. That doesn't include Vizquel, who's at 397. So oh, virtually a sixth guy at 400. They were only the ninth team in Major League history, the eighth in this century, to have five guys with 400 on base percentages. You know, a lot of teams consider themselves lucky they got hey, a leadoff oh, man. On, yeah. <laughs> the leadoff guys are 400, well, that's pretty right, good. That is pretty good. And they had five guys there. And that 1950 Red Sox team was one of those. Ted Williams, Johnny Pesky, Billy Goodman, Al Zarilla, Dominic DiMaggio. 39 Yankees, one of the highest scoring teams in history. You know, the Yankees had three different teams, Joe. The three highest scoring teams of all time, averaging just a little bit below seven runs per game. They had three different teams. I mean, in a 154 game schedule, they scored 1,067 runs. Unbelievable. That is unbelievable. And that was uh, the, the Yankees of Ruth and Gehrig, and then later the, the DiMaggio Yankees in the late 30s. You mentioned somebody with the Red Sox is dear to me, and that's Billy Goodman. They call him Chicken Wing, the original Chicken Wing. It was because he didn't throw very well. <laughs> I could see that he was a, a very close friend of you. Yeah, well. <laughs> They call mine the chicken wings, you know, the flapping elbow, it. The elbow flat. But yeah, but Billy Goodman, who was my one of my first minor league coaches, he and uh, Dave Philly, and uh, they called him Chicken Wing, and he was one of those guys. He beat Ted Williams out for a batting championship one year. That was the year. Well, I think it was 1950. Yeah. I mean, uh, amazing. I mean, somebody beat Ted Williams on his own team for well, a batting championship. Williams ended up being injured in the All Star game right, that, that year. year. And so Goodman ended up playing a lot more and. It was a pretty good feeling. And he was very humble about that. That's what he said to me. He said, man, if Ted would have been okay, well, then I wouldn't have hit anything. I'd have had my normal spot on the bench. And that's a called strike to Kenny Lofton. Lofton may have had one of the, maybe the key at bat of the game, considering the, the key failure of turning a double play by the Red Sox. Then Lofton came up, battled and battled and battled with Saberhagen, making him build that pitch count up. Seeing Sabregan growing increasingly weary. And finally on the 10th pitch, Lofton walked. A 10-pitch battle with Sabregan in the third inning. That put two men on with one out. And then Vizquel, the next hitter, hit the triple. There goes Travis Fryman. He had a huge jump. Well, he had a huge jump because they were playing behind him. So the Indians don't feel like six is enough. Well, I don't think you can say six is enough. You're in the fourth inning. I don't think you have put this game out of reach, and the Indians are still playing their game. But I think they just felt like he wouldn't run. You see, he's behind him. I mean, you, you're playing behind him. You're inviting him to run, and you can see Veritek had no shot at throwing him out. Now, Sparky never would have had him steal there ahead by five. Well, I, 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 he would. <laughs> I think he would in today's game. <laughs> in fact, I had. That's a pop-up foul coming back out of play off to the left. John, I had this similar conversation with Buck Showalter when I was in Arizona one day, and he was telling me about the time that he did something like that to Sparky, right? He ran, you know, with a 6-1 to one lead or something in the seventh inning, and Sparky yelled at him. And then Sparky's team came back and beat him 10-7. to seven. And so Sparky came over and apologized to him. He said, you're right, in today's game, Five runs is not too many get runs to steal a base. And I, I don't think in today's market, I don't know when it, I don't know what enough is today. Well, six apparently is not it. One almost hit Lofton in the foot. Two balls, two strikes. You mean five, isn't it? But yeah. six, well, I mean, six, six may yeah. not be it either. Five run lead. <laughs> yeah, six may not it either. I don't know what the number is. I mean, you're in the playoffs. And if you're ahead at this point, six to one, I mean, do you stop? running the bases do you stop I, I say no because it's so important now 
I mean, you have to win. I mean, and, and, and the playoffs are, are a little different than a regular season. A lot of people say that when you run with a big lead, you're showing the other team up. Well, that's definitely not the case in the playoffs. You're not trying to show anyone up. You're just trying to win the ball game. And in the dirt again. And it's three and two. Lofton again battling a Red Sox pitcher here, working deep into the count. Three and two. Well, consider this when uh, talking about whether they should have run there or shouldn't have. I mean, Cleveland gave up. 860 runs. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, that is unbelievable. That Their team earned run average was 4.9. 4.9. And that is a walk. So Lofton walks again. The second walk of the inning. Fifth walk of the game drawn by Cleveland. Two men on. One man out. And Omar Vizquel comes up. You know, 860 runs in a 162-game schedule. I mean, that's five and the third runs a game allowed. So they needed to score those thousand runs you're talking about. Six is not a uh, six to one lead is not, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> I'd have both of them run right now. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, so many runs scored, you know, in today's games. It, it is difficult to decide when to shut down your offense or when to slow it down. Kell, who hit that two-run triple just over the glove of Trot Nixon in the right field corner. And the score was one to nothing Boston. And put Cleveland ahead. And Alomar doubled him home. And then later Harold Baines hit a three-run homer. A blue right along the left field line. That is in there. Base hit. Fryman stops at third. O'Leary gave a little deep job. As he uh, played it on the bounce, they're loaded for Roberto Alomar. And you were talking about the fact that how often Real you know, Ramirez gets to hit with runners in scoring position. Well, I think the thing thing is happening with Alomar on this ball club because to drive in 120 runs, you have to have a lot of opportunities. And you've got Vizquel at the top and Lofton. I mean, they seem like they're always on base. This is just a great lineup. And I, I can imagine how people used to feel in the 60s when they were play, placing the mighty Yankees. You know, you, you can't make any mistakes. You can't do anything wrong. Or they might just roll right over you. So it, this ball club is very similar to that. I mean, they all know how to, what their jobs are. They know what they're supposed to do in this lineup. Well, the teams that get compared to Cleveland in terms of just the, the sheer numbers of runs that they scored this year are among the highest scoring teams in the history of the game. And you see Roberto Alomar. 323 with 24 homers, 120 RBIs. Of course, he's never hit in the third spot a full season before. And he never hit in a lineup behind two guys like Lofton and Vizquel who get on base all the time steal bases they score from first on extra base hits they score from second on your singles I mean this is almost a perfect lineup though John. I mean that's that's the key but then I think he makes it perfect and that's too low I mean remember now this Cleveland team was a very good team you know before but I think he makes it almost perfect there because he's a guy that's not going to strike out with the runner at third in less than two outs that makes a big difference in a, in a, in a lineup and in a batting order Is too high, two and one. So it's not just that he's a 300 hitter and he's driven in all these runs, but it's sort of like the way that he. Yeah, is. it's the, he's the guy that if you get the third base with less than two outs, he's going to put the ball in play. One out right now with three men on. Ooh. Two balls, two strikes. Kind of lunging after that fastball there. Two balls, two strikes to Alomar. That's Fryman who led off the inning with a walk. At third base, Lofton who walked at second, Oman Vizquel who singled at first. Six to one, Cleveland in the fourth inning. Wazda trying to get out of a jam. Let's see what, see what I mean about Joe. He's gotten in home. You know, you're not going to strike him out, and that's smart. I mean, he he realizes, okay, I was going to try to get a base hit up until I got two strikes. Now my job is to put the ball in play. And that's why I said that the third spot is so important on a team where you get a lot of guys on base. Not just for you driving in, but what you do for the guy behind you, meaning Ramirez. 
Well, I mean, just watch this. This is not a, I'm trying to get a base hit swing. He says, I got to put the ball in play. See what I mean? He just kind of flips the bat at the ball. He's not going to strike out. He was making sure he wasn't going to strike out. And that's what you do when you're in that situation. First, until you get two strikes, you're trying to drive the ball. But once you get two strikes, he knows that his job is to put the ball in play. So Roberto Alomar, who was two for four in game one last night, is now two for two with a sacrifice fly. Two doubles, two batted in here today. 7-1, Manny Ramirez, who has not driven in anybody. With a runner at second in the first, he struck out. With a runner at second in the third, he flied out. And without any input from Manny Ramirez, they have seven runs on the board. Lofton at second, be scout at first. And that sharp breaking ball is too low. Two balls and no strikes. Manny Ramirez, 165 RBI since World War II. That's the most in the majors. Ted Maybe. Williams and Vern Stevens both had 159 on the same team. The Red Sox of 49. <laughs> and that curve misses on the outside. 3 and 0. This Cleveland ball club reminds you of so many Red Sox teams. I mean, it looks like a Fenway Park kind of a team. No. All, of the, all of the slugging, but the Red Sox never had all of that speed. No, I can say, it, I don't know if you'd ever get him out in the small ballpark or the smaller ballpark like, you know, the Fenway Park with that left field spin step. So you know the count. And ball four. Well, that's the third walk of this inning. Red Sox pitchers gave up the fewest walks in Major League Baseball this year. And today they have allowed six walks, all in the last two innings, and four of those walks have scored. And the reason they're walking more than before is because they're trying to make good pitches. They're, they know that they cannot just throw the ball down the middle to these hitters. They're trying to make good pitches, and in doing so, you're going to miss sometimes. Miss more often than you would if you're just trying to throw strikes. Here's Jim Tomey. He had his 13th postseason home run last night. And the changeup through there for a strike. Lofton, Vizquel, and Ramirez, the three runners. Fastball down and in. Now Jim Tomey has the fourth highest career home run rate for a bat in a postseason play in Major League history among all players with at least 10 home runs. Babe Ruth, Lenny Dykstra. How about that for a home run name? And Lou Gehrig and then Jim Tomey. For home run ratio in the postseason. Tomey's averaged one home run for every 12 postseason at bats. Now, one thing I'm not in agreement with is lumping World Series homers I agree. with other postseason homers. To me, World Series, that's not postseason. That's the World Series. The World Series. Two and one the count. You see the Boston bullpen was busy. Tommy slams one a long way. Nixon back. It's a grand slam. to one Cleveland a five run inning a grand slam for Tommy his second homer of this series well John I think 11 to one you can stop stealing bases <laughs> but they're done with that well because I you know 11 to one you can just try to get some runs another way man I tell you this is an offensive juggernaut Harold Baines who hit a three run homer his last time too low because it's not just the power it's just knowing how to run an offense guys hitting behind runners guys hitting singles when they need to guys making sure they put the ball in play when they need to they do just about everything correctly 
Giants have called strength to Baines. Two and one. Baines has singled and hit a three run homer. His uh, home run coming at a more crucial time than Tommy's slam, that's for sure. It was only three to one when Baines hit the three run shot. High pop fly, left center. Man, what's wrong with Baines? That's all he can do? <laughs> the Cleveland Indians are flexing their muscles here at the Jake. A six run third, and now a five run fourth. 11 to 1 Cleveland run lead as we start the fifth inning. It is 11 to 1 Cleveland. Well, Leary singled his first time, one of four Boston hits. And that's too low. Two balls, no strikes. O'Leary, Stanley, and Husky. And that is low. 3 0. Oh. Nagy, who got knocked around by left handed hitters this year. Lefties hit 323 against him. That was the third worst record against left handers in the entire American League. Although he was much stronger against right handers. He has pitched uh, every year of the 90s with the Cleveland Indians. One of only six pitchers to have done that. Tommy! He is not merely a slugger. <laughs> Man, they're doing everything. Let's take a look at this home run by Tommy. Very similar to the one he hit last year. We watched the ball would be out over the plate. Out there, look at that. He gets his arms extended and he puts a charge into it. Look at that. I mean, great extension. That's that's a that's a slugger swing right there. From any angle. Tommy is now homered in each of the last four postseason games in which he's played. He homered in the last two games of that series with the Yankees last year, the American League. Championship series and he met just miss it in the home run in the game that could have turned the series between the Yankees and the Cleveland Indians last year he hit a yeah. home run, hit a ball in the right center field and the wind came up and knocked it down and it turned out to be a great save for him there's the defense that Tommy shows you well when your offense perks up everything else perks up too so just a good day for Tommy. that is a fair ball past third by Mike Stanley. Stanley digging for second, and he just does make it. And Cleveland is uh, really not just trying to beat the Red Sox or batter the Red Sox. They're trying to smother them here. <laughs> well, a close play at second base. Watch Alomar tag just as he gets on the bag. So Stanley makes it. That would have been a little embarrassing to, with the score 11 to 1. I don't know. I don't know. Little. <laughs> Could have been very embarrassing. Here's Butch Husky. The Negi got his spike caught. But if he stops, it's a ball. So he just went ahead and threw the ball because if he if he stops as a balk, he's going to go to third. If he throws a wild pitch, he's going to go to third. So he he let Sandy Alomar save him. See his foot gets caught, and that's a great save there by Sandy Alomar Jr. Now isn't that a balk anyway? Well, he, he released it though. I don't think he stopped his motion. But I guess you could call the balk. I don't think it was. You see some of his teammates kind of laughing a little bit. Bartolo Colon thought it was pretty hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the most incredible save I've ever seen by a catcher. Yeah, you're right. Especially, I mean, how, you, how can you expect the ball to be thrown that badly? A little bit low on the outside. Two balls and a strike. I mean, he's got a 10-run lead. You know, the their chance to make the World Series might not have been riding on whether or not he prevented that wild pitch, but that's the way Sandy Alomar knows how to play the game. Two and two. You know, Cal Ripken, the same thing. Yeah. You don't think about it, you know, when you're playing, truthfully. Right now, you do not think about the score being 11 to 1. You know, as a professional, you play the game like it's the first or second inning, no score. I mean, that's what you do. You play the game the way it's supposed to be played, and you just play it that way all the time. Instinctively. It's an instinctive thing. I mean, he didn't think about diving for that. It's just something that he did because he knows that's what he's supposed to do. 
And as you mentioned, when Ripken's playing, he does it because he knows that's what he's supposed to do. But I, I have a theory that goes even a little bit uh -oh. that. Uh oh. Really? Okay. Let me hear this theory. No, the, the theory is is that some guys not only are so into the game that they play it that way all the time, but they have such a passion for the game. That their best time of the day is when they're here at the ballpark and the game begins. I now, you know what? I'm going to go along with you on that theory. There are some guys that are more passionate about their jobs than other guys. I mean, I think that's just natural. We're human beings. Our personalities are different. So I'm going to have to say that your theory was not bad. Well, yeah. there's probably nothing to it. Yeah, then. no, I, I think it is. I think there is. Uh, passion is is very important. So two down, and uh, Trot Nixon the hitter. You're passionate about your job. Yeah, I, I was. <laughs> I was until the fourth inning. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One ball and no strikes to Trot Nixon. He doubled his first time. Stanley at second, having doubled. Here in the fifth inning, 11 to 1, Cleveland ahead. And that is caught by Tony. <laughs> 11 to 1, Cleveland. We're going to the last of the fifth inning. And uh oh, Cleveland is coming up. Cleveland 11, the Red Sox won. Last of the fifth inning, one of America's most enduring corporate images, the Goodyear blimp, is floating overhead, providing our aerial views for today's game. The Spirit of Akron is one of seven airships in the Goodyear blimp fleet. Goodyear now has two blimps in Europe, one in South America, one in Australia, and three right here in the USA. David Justice takes a strike from the new Boston pitcher, the knuckleballer. Tim Wakefield comes on now. And John, you know this is a great lineup when you have a guy, David Justice, hitting seventh. Well, I mean, and for this Cleveland ball club, and David Justice, who was a World Series hero, he beat the Cleveland Indians with a home run in the deciding game of the 1995 World Series while with the Atlanta Braves. I mean, he was uh, one of the top sluggers in the National League. And down on strikes facing the knuckleballer, Wakefield. For the Indians, one away. Third baseman, Travis Fryman. Not Travis Fryman who started each of the rallies in the third and fourth innings with a walk. Because last night he was the man who finished the rally in the ninth inning of a 2-2 game. And that looms even larger now with the Indians in the process of blowing out the Red Sox in this one. One ball, no strikes to Travis Fryman. Too high. Two balls, no strikes. And ball three. Sandy Alomar on deck. Only center field is still in the late afternoon sunshine now. Throws him a fastball for a strike, does Wakefield. Three and one. Cleveland has 11 runs with seven hits. Red Sox, one run, five hits. Another fastball, another strike. Three and two the count. Wakefield was a starter. Then for a long while after Tom Gordon went down with an injury, he was the closer. John. And ball four, the third straight time that Fryman has walked. And John, I think he likes you calling those fastballs. Everybody else says the pitch. <laughs> fastball. Yeah. Here's last night. Against Garces with the bases loaded. O'Leary had nowhere to throw it. The winning run scored. And the first game, which Cleveland had not won in a series during for eight consecutive series. They kept losing the first game of every series. And the reason they thought they lost, or one, one explanation was they've never had a number one guy. You know, like a Pedro Martinez, like a David Wells, like someone that, you know, starts your, you know, they're going to start the first game. Until now, Bartolo Colon is quickly moving into that spot. And he's the guy that you will probably see start any first game of any other series that they have. Sandy Alomar, 0 for 2 in the game. One ball, two strike count. There's Colon. 
Now, Jimmy Williams, the, the Red Sox manager, was so impressed with Cologne last night. He said before the game tonight, he said, man, this guy seemed to get stronger right. as the game went along. He was still clocked at 99 miles an hour in the eighth inning. I talked to Mark Grace yesterday. Remember, he was in Atlanta with us, and I rode back to the hotel with him. We were talking about Cologne. And they faced him once, the Cubs did. And he said the same thing. He said, man, in the ninth inning, he was still throwing 99 miles an hour. And he said, if he's not an ace, he doesn't know what is one, because he can get away with just one, do it with just that one pitch. Just off the glove of Veritek, but holding it first was Travis Fry. Two balls, two strikes, the count to Sandy Alomar. You know who else said that? After an interleague game, it was Craig Biggio. For, uh, maybe it was Bagwell. Maybe it's both of them. I can't remember which one. But well, they, they're two peas in a pod. One of those killer bee guys. Yeah. And uh, they were just astounded as to how good he was. Nice catch by Offerman. These guys make that look easy. That's a tough play. And we saw Vizquel make the same kind of a play last year. Right? Look at this. He goes back and look how tough it is. An over the shoulder catch with the left with the right fielder bearing down on you. That's the other part of this. You're not you don't want to have a collision out there but it's a nice play by Offerman. Well you mentioned last night and this is like unbelievable to me. I mean you didn't see Offerman call Trot Nixon off but look at that. He calls <laughs> Loft it off and still makes the catch. I mean, that's that is just a difficult play to make, and both of them made it look easy. Yeah, in fact, I've changed my mind about that being a difficult catch. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Hey, maybe you're right. <laughs> Obviously, it may not be as tough as it looks. Huh? <laughs> I'm not that impressed now. It usually happens uh, three, four times every game. <laughs> Two down, runner at first. Here's Lofty. It is two and one. Lofton has struck out and twice walked. The walk. The Red Sox, who walked fewer batters during the year than any other pitching staff, have walked seven Cleveland Indians today. And they've walked the seven of them in the last three innings. And six of those walks have either scored or set up runs. That's a called strike. Well, that's. That's what we're talking about. Five guys with on base averages of over 400, which means that to get on base with either a hit or a walk or be hit by a pitch more than 40% of the time. That one is a strikeout. He missed the pitch, but it got past Veritek, and everybody's safe. Wow, now it's gotten so bad, even when they strike somebody out, the guy gets on base. Well, it happens with a knuckleballer out there. Catcher's got a real tough job. <laughs> and mean, look, that pitch just defied gravity. <laughs> well, it's very difficult sometimes to handle those pitches. You see Veritek, I mean, the ball's dancing. You don't know exactly where it's going. That's what makes a knuckleball so tough to, to catch. I guess they call that a pass ball, I would assume. Yeah, they did. But I don't know how Veritek could have caught it. That, that, that shot we had from the center field camera. I mean, he's got the glove right there, and the ball just disappeared. That one is inside. I just think that Joe, the, the knuckleballer out there, they should just never call a pass ball. Right? It's, it, the catcher's under duress. Well, he is under duress, but he's got a lot of equipment. He can block it. He doesn't have to catch it cleanly. I mean, what? Follow this one to the glove. Look at that. Just <laughs> drop straight down. Well, that's why Lofton missed it. I mean, that's why he couldn't hit it. He swung at it. His cow is out on strikes. And 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 he's out. We're going to the sixth inning. 11 to 1. Cleveland. The Cleveland Indians, 11 runs, 7 hits. The Boston Red Sox, 1 run, 5 hits as we head to the 6th inning. Cleveland with a 3-run homer by Harold Baines in the 6-run 5th inning. And a grand slam by Jim Tomey in the 5-run 4th inning. Now Boston coming up with Damon Buford against right-hander Charles Nagy. Buford, he 
struck out his first time. Red Sox actually at one point led in this game. They got a run in the third. And the Offerman two out single a clutch hit. But then Cleveland blew it open with a six run third and then made no doubt about it with a five run fourth. Eleven to one Cleveland. Blowing outside from Nagy. Lead off man Offerman on deck. Game three of the series. Dave Berba is scheduled. He was a 15 game winner for Cleveland this year. The ball is foul. Two balls and two strikes. That game will be Saturday at Fenway Park. Ramon Martinez will pitch for the Boston Red Sox, which is a great story. Is hit high in the air into left center field, going back Lofton to the warning track. And that is not one. John, we were talking about that knuckleball and how much it's dancing. You, Vizquel decided he was going to go up there right-handed. He didn't even switch hit last time. He's up there right-handed against Wakefield. And look at this. Hmm. Now, maybe he'll go back to the other side, but it's it's tough. And sometimes you go up there to right-handed because you think you can see the ball better. Well, and we might well see that when Roberto Alomar comes right. up in the last half of this inning. Alomar often will do the same thing. That you uh, notice that, Joe. It's my job. <laughs> see whether the score is one to one or eleven to one. Still passionate. Huh? You are still in there <laughs> hustling. <laughs> Nothing gets by you. You do it the same way, one way or the other. Jim Tomey. And uh, the put out for Nagy. Offerman retired for the first time in this game. He was two for two before that. Phil Regan, the pitching coach and uh, manager, Mike Hargrove with Cleveland. Regan was the pitching coach in Chicago last year. Well, we got. Uh, we got a truck on the highway there, it looks like, John. Let's go to our traffic reporter, Joe Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> traffic and weather together. Here's Joe Morgan. Hope it's not on the way to the airport. <laughs> that was at the, the closing of Candlestick Park last Thursday. The closing for baseball yeah. at Candlestick. Sorry, and, uh, I couldn't be there. I tried. It was 82 degrees at game time and crystal clear. Just an incredible day. Unlike almost every other day for 40 years that the Giants played there. Well, they knew it was the last day. Candlestick just took care of that. But it has that candlestick look of the fog starting to roll in a little bit, doesn't it? Two and one the count. As John Ballantin doesn't get it. Two and two. Ballantin has struck out and flied out to left center. Two down, nobody on. Charles Nagy has not walked anybody. His teammates have received seven walks. That's a foul. He's had a two and two count here only two times as he had a three ball count on a hitter. And he has shut down Nomar Garcia Parra. He's not pitched around him. He's got Nomar to ground out and strike out in this one. Well, Mike Hargrove, he might well tell you, it's great to be young and a Cleveland Indian. <laughs> the strikeout with the split fingered pitch so it's all Cleveland they are burying the Red Sox here in game two of this best of five now Alomar Ramirez and Tommy coming up yeah Jim Tommy he wears the uh, the mantle of the hero awfully well as he seems to be at his very best when the calendar turns to October. Grand slam here today. Speaking of picking things up a little bit in the postseason here is Roberto Alomar and he is batting left handed against the knuckleballer Wakefield just as he would against any other right handed. That's a foul out of play off the left field line. You know who he used to bat right handed against? Or, or, he would, bat, he would bat opposite the way you would expect. Yeah. 
he would bat left-handed against Fernando Valenzuela. Well, I talked to him, but we were talking before the game about guys doing that, and he said that the toughest thing he found when that happened was that if a guy had a curveball, it really bothered him. But Fernando would throw more sliders and screwballs to a left-hander, not his big curveball. Alomar punches it into left center field. That's another base hit. His third hit. He is three for three plus a sacrifice fly. And he is five for seven in this series. Big double header. Friday night on ESPN Sports Century. We continue the countdown of the top 50 North American athletes of the 20th century. Number 17, Magic Johnson. And then number 16, Ted Williams. Williams, who hit 406 in 1941, a Hall of Famer. Magic Johnson, Ted Williams at 10 Eastern on Friday on ESPN. Annie Ramirez. Well, Ramirez had 165 RBIs, which was incredible. I mean, the likes of which you've not seen since before World War II. Jimmy Fox, I believe Jimmy Fox with the Red Sox at 175. It's the last time anybody had as many or more than what Ramirez did. And yet the Indians put 11 runs on the board tonight virtually without him. <laughs> no. He has struck out, flight out. He did walk just before Tommy's grand slam in the fourth inning. And that's... A ball, 3-0. Roberto Alomar at first. Nobody out. They're not holding Alomar over at first base. And Alomar's not running with a score 11-1. to one. And that's a cold strike. Jim Tomey. Next. Three balls and a strike. Cleveland a six-run third and a five-run fourth. That fastball is foul back over the screen and out of play. John, I think one thing we should mention here, we were talking about the MVP earlier, you know, in the broadcast. The MVP votes have to go in the day after the final game of the season. So what you do in the playoffs, you're not supposed to have any bearing on whether you're the most valuable player in the league or not. And that's the way it should be. Correct, because everyone doesn't get a chance to play in the playoffs. You know, you maybe have a chance to, to be the MVP, but your team doesn't make the playoffs, and everyone else gets a chance to shine one more time when you will not. So they're supposed to go in all the voting for the Cy Young Awards. We take a look at this knuckleball here, and it's dancing. But for your Cy Young Award, Rookie of the Year, all of those vo votes are supposed to be in the Monday of the final game of the same day. The other season, Monday after the final day of the season. And that's the baseball writers. Right. Baseball writers of America. Not you and me. No, we don't get a vote. No. We, we're not allowed to vote. No. Ernie Harwell is here today, the Hall of Fame broadcaster of the Detroit Tigers. He's working the game for ESPN Radio. And there's Ernie, the maestro at the microphone, broadcasting baseball on the radio for more than half of this century. Deep in the center. By Buford. Satomi is retired after his grand slam in the fourth inning. A fly ball this time against the knuckleball. Two down. Alomar still at first base, and Harold Baines will be coming up. And Ernie Harwell doesn't get a vote either. <laughs> Ernie doesn't even get a vote on who should be in the Hall of Fame. Except. Well, I don't think he does. There's that uh, Veterans Committee. Yeah, I don't know if he's on there. To, get a vote a for, to vote on any of the awards, you have to have been a beat writer for 10 years, you know, covering a, a team for 10 years. You know, that's how you get a vote. So it's not like you can just join up and get a vote. You have to pay your dues, and baseball writers have guys who have had their tenure, and now they're able to vote for the Hall of Fame and vote for most viral player awards, individual awards. Harold Baines has singled and hit a three-run homer. And his three-run homer was really the, the crushing blow of that six-run third inning. It was three to one when he hit it. Two and one the count to Harold Baines. That's what was pretty astounding about this Cleveland ball club with all of their offense. Before the trading deadline, they went out and got another great hitter. <laughs> yeah. 
and it's paying off. Well, and the other thing is they've got another hitter over there that doesn't even get to play anymore. Will Cordero, he was having a great season until he was hit, you know, by a pitch and was out for a while, and now he doesn't play very well. At 2.99, about a third of a season, and. How about Richie Sexton has not right. played yet in this postseason. He drove in 116 runs in the regular season. <laughs> and that's ball four. So Alomar over to second. Baines with the walk. Back in the third inning. It could have been two down and nobody on with a one nothing lead for Boston. But Sandy Alomar hit this ground ball. And Offerman did not turn the double play. And later... Armando well, Scale got this one just over the right fielder's head. And then Baines capped it off with a three run big fly. It was one of those innings where just a couple of little things where Cleveland might have been held off the scoreboard entirely. Right. Saberhagen might even still be in the ball game. And he ends up not surviving that inning. He threw 37 pitches in that inning. 26 of them after that missed double play. Well, that's one of those 11 and 1 situations right there. Robbie didn't take third base or didn't try to push it, you know, because the score is 11 to 1. He didn't want to, you know, push it. But if that were, if there was nothing to nothing, I think he would have gone to third on that play. John, I've, I've been basically thinking of this and saying it all year. Defense is far more important today than it's ever been. And that's because anytime you make a mistake or you give these teams an extra out to score so many runs, I mean, you're in trouble. It doesn't have to be just the Cleveland Indians. If any team in baseball today scores, you know, more runs than they used to. So if you make an error and extend the inning or make a mistake and extend the, extend the inning, you're just really asking for trouble when you give them extra outs. Justice pops it up. Fairground, he grabs it, and that's the inning. Two men left for Cleveland. We're heading to the seventh inning. Baracek and Nomar Garcia Barrett coming up. Cleveland 11, Boston 1. We're into the top of the seventh inning from Jacobs Field. Jason Baracek takes too high for ball one from Charles Nagy. And John, we have to give Nagy a lot of credit. I mean, he has been able to, you know, keep the ball down. He's been able to keep the Red Sox in check until his team was able to score a lot of runs. Because after three innings, he was down one to nothing, and he just pitched very well this entire ball game. He's only given up the five base hits. One ball, one strike to Baratek. And that's a foul ball up the first base side. The Red Sox New Era sports caps in-game box score. And not too many hits in there for Boston. Jose Offerman has driven in the only run. He's got two for three. Omar Garcia power 0 for two. The Red Sox have only three runs in the two games of this series so far. Jim Tomey over to Nagy covering and there's one away. Let's go to our spotlight reporter Rick Sutcliffe. Well John after losing Pedro Martinez last night it's clear the Boston Red Sox are just not the same team today that they were yesterday. They can look at the fastball last night and the location of it to Nomar Garcia Parra. Bartolo Colon up and away. Garcia Parra right on it going the other way. Here's basically the same fastball today, but everybody on their team, including their leader, Garcia Parr, just trying to do a little bit too much. A lot of guys pulling off the baseball, trying to hit it out of the park, therefore no offense. All right, Rick. Well, that's interesting as Garcia Parra takes ball one off the outside. 11 to 1 the score. No more. A batting champion this year. What a season. 357. He had 27 home runs. He had 104 runs battered in. And he spent time with the disabled. He missed 27 games this year. He also got hit in the wrist by a pitch that hampered him. Long throw by nice Freiman, and he got him. Nice play. And you have to remember, Garcia Parra gets down the line very quickly. So Freiman didn't have much time to even think about anything. He had to just get it and get rid of it right here. Look at this, he goes deep. Now he's he doesn't even take the crow hop, so to speak, to go toward first base. He just gets rid of it quickly mm -hmm. and he just barely nips Garcia Parr at first base. Well, I remember Fryman when he 
first came up with the Detroit Tigers under Spark Anderson. He was a, a, a guy who they thought was going to end up being their shortstop. Yeah, they had a right. pretty good shortstop at that time by the name of Alan Trammell. But they thought that he was going to be very strong and short. That's a called strike to Troy O'Leary. I remember Sparky Anderson telling me that, you know, talking about Travis and he was going to be a great shortstop and so forth. But Trammell and Whitaker played so long there that they had to find another spot for him. He played third base. So, and, you know, that reminds those two guys. They played a long time together, Trammell and Whitaker in Detroit. Yeah, that Ernie Harwell was telling me before the game that there were some great moments at the final game at Tiger Stadium a week ago Monday. O'Leary takes inside. Two and two, including Trammell and Whitaker, both basically coming onto the field at the same time. <laughs> yeah, because you can't think of one without thinking right. of the other. Longest running double play combination in the history of baseball. And that's caught by Lofton out there in center. After initially starting in, he went back to get it. Nagy has retired 12 of the last 13 men he's faced. ESPN's coverage of the divisional playoffs is brought to you by Eddie Bauer, outdoor outfitter since 1920, and by Circuit City, answers in every department, low prices all over the store. John Miller and Joe Morgan with you from Cleveland, 11 to 1, Cleveland leading the Boston Red Sox as we move to the last half. Of the seventh inning, and here's the Cleveland Indians new era sports caps in game box score. And there's a, a whole lot to report there. Although it's ironic at the top, Kenny Lofton is 0 for 2, and yet he may have had the most important game turning at bat of the whole day after the Red Sox failed to turn a double play on a ground ball hit by Sandy Alomar. Lofton had the 10 pitch at bat and ended up walking against Saberhagen, and it was the beginning of the end for the. Red Sox right-hander and ultimately maybe for the Red Sox in this game and in this series. Well, his on-base percentage is 500. He's two for four. And when you're hitting leadoff, that's, that's, your, that's job. your primary job. And yeah. he scored uh, two runs. Here we see Tom Flash Gordon. And they, they wanted to bring him in in the seventh inning. They were hoping they'd be in a different situation. Freeman had walked three straight times including at the beginning of each of those two big rallies. This time, they just kind of save a few pitches. This time goes to first. And, uh, well, Flash Gordon has a great curveball and a good fastball, and Fryman, well, he can't get out of the way. Fastball in. Sandy Alomar, and fastball is in there for a strike. Flash Gordon had one of the greatest curveballs in the major leagues. And when he was a starter, that was his main pitch. One on the count. There's that curveball you're talking about. Not quite as sharp as I've seen it, though, John. That one didn't, wasn't, didn't start as high and didn't break down as sharply. Well, he had uh, arm problems this year. Missed most of the season. Pretty sharp. Yeah. And Alomar is quickly dispatched. One away in the seventh. The you know, Gordon now batting center fielder in the Kendrick division Ball. series last year, October the third, at Fenway Park, the final game as it turned out. The Red Sox carried a one to nothing lead into the eighth inning of that game. And Gordon ended up giving up two runs in the eighth inning on a two-run double by David Justice. And that has sort of burned in his memory ever since. And Gordon was just so excited to be named to this postseason roster because it was not a sure thing as Lofton takes a strike. Uh, Jimmy Williams said he only really made it because his last two outings in the regular season, he had good pop in his fastball and looked like he was uh, snapping off that curveball again. So he put him on there. But because of that loss to Cleveland, Gordon said going into the series, the Indians can't imagine how bad I want to face those guys again. I think I'm ready to help our team win this thing. So he came in. 
I guess, what, a little revenge in mind and, uh, and very confident in his ability to get him out. That's the right attitude to have. If you make a mistake or something happens, goes against you, you want to get back out there and correct it. He had not blown a save the whole year. Right. 40, what was it, 47 for 47? Like 46 in the regular season and one in the postseason last year. And then that one in the game that could have kept them alive. Remember, they were down two games to one. And Pedro Martinez was waiting. Pedro was lingering for game five. It would have been Pedro, and the whole postseason could have had a different look to it. But Cleveland got two runs against uh, Tom Gordon, and that was the end of the season. That's a pop up foul off the left field line. Long run for O'Leary. Not quite. Two and two the count to Kenny Lofton, who has been on base three times. He reached, went striking out in the fifth inning on a, what was scored a, as a pass ball. And you can see here he's getting close to the tarp and the stands. And it's a tough play. You have to slow up. You don't want to run into the fence right there. No chance to risk injury. Not right now when it comes down 11 to 1. Often fouls that one. Still two balls, two strikes. Well, this is a historic Cleveland franchise. And, you know, you go back into the 30s after World War II into the 50s, and this Cleveland ball club was behind the Yankees. Annually, the best in baseball. That's a swing and a miss, and always with great pitching. I mean, we're seeing this slugging Cleveland team now. The awesome lineup. But you go back to the days of, of Bob Feller and Bob Lemon, early win, Mike Garcia. And, I mean, they sent a top pitcher out at you every single day. And in 1954, they won 111 games. Lou Boudreau was a, a player manager on the World Series team for the Cleveland in 1948. But in 1954, they won 111 games and lost only 43. A better record than the Yankees had last year. You know, better winning percentage. They played eight fewer games than the Yankees did. But they went to the World Series and got swept by the New York Giants. And say hey, kid. No, that was 51. Well, I mean, Willie Mays was there in 54, yeah. 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 He made that incredible catch off the on the ball hit by Vic Wirtz at the Polo Grounds. That's up and away for a ball. 3 0. Oh. But Cleveland, it took them a long time to get back to the World Series after that. 1995 was the next time they went to the World Series. Kenny Lofton had a very fine series, too, against Atlanta that year, although the Braves won it. But they have not won a World Series since the 1940s. That's a called strike. Three and one the count. 1948, they beat the Boston Braves. They were the Boston Braves then. Later to become the Milwaukee Braves, still later to become the Atlanta Braves. And too low to Vizquel. So he walks. So Gordon has put two men on, and now Roberto Alomar is up again. I want to remind you about some college football coming your way tonight on ESPN at 7.30 Eastern. The 17th ranked Syracuse Orange men go to Pittsburgh to take on the Panthers. Syracuse only loss was a heartbreaker at home against Michigan earlier this year. Big East Conference football, 7.30 tonight, Eastern time, beginning with college game night presented by Gateway. Check it out. We're at Jacobs Field here in Cleveland. It's the, uh, the baseball season in the lingering shadows of autumn in the late afternoon. But the, the baseball season is just starting to heat up. Later tonight, the Yankees and Texas Rangers game two of their series. A must win for the Texas Rangers. And are they going to score a run there at Yankee Stadium? That's, that's the first step. That's got to put a little extra heat on a... On a a hitter, doesn't it? I mean, your, your team in the media capital of the world, and you can't score a run, and it's gone for two straight Octobers. Roberto Alomar plays the ball. Yankee Stadium is a tough place to play, John. Let's face it. I mean, you're playing the ghost of Ruth and everyone else when you stand there in that stadium, and they always remind you of that. Now, in between our commercial, Jimmy Williams went out to check on Flash Garden to see if he was okay with the umpire. So 
without a visit to the mound. He was just checking on his physical condition. Right. And he's really seems like, uh, and I understand why he's checking on me. All of a sudden, he seems like he just kind of lost the velocity on his fastball and his strike zone. And it's off the outside. You know, John, I was looking at this just because we we're talking about how good this Cleveland Indians team is. Roberto Alomar, every time he's come up today, I think he's had a runner in score position except the first time. Yeah. And then following that, Ramirez has had the same thing. You know, he's uh, he's driven in three, and he's, uh, but he's driven two runs. Yeah, he's driven in. That's all. I think he's driven in two or three. I got you. Two. You're right. Okay. And I'm just saying that, and and, and even and now here, if he doesn't get him in, there's Ramirez. He's yeah. got a chance. So the third and fourth hitters, because of Lofton, and you know most of the time in Vizquel, I mean they're in great shape. But that's what makes a good team. Three and two, two down, no, and uh, the two runners go, and Alomar pops it up. Left fielder Troy O'Leary waiting for it, and that ends the inning. We're heading to the eighth inning now from Jacobs Field. It's 11 to 1, Cleveland. Yeah. Now the Aflac trivia question. Pedro Martinez, who won game one last year. Before that, who was the last Red Sox pitcher to win a postseason game? And you mentioned they've lost 17 out of 18 since 1986, well, right? Since game six of the yeah. 86 World Series. Right. So that means game five, I believe they that was they won to go ahead three so games to two. Been Whoever pits game five. Bob. Who was it? You're asking me? I don't know anything it's the about trivia. Hey, you know, question. I know nothing about Come trivia. On. We're always pouring over all Chir those. Chiraldi started the last game, I think, or was in the last game. As, uh, by the way, Steve Carse on the pitch for Cleveland. And in the midst of this 11 1 game, a, a laugher for the Cleveland Indians here against the Red Sox. Only six outs needed to, to wrap this one up. The game itself. Has not been in doubt for a good long while as Stanley takes the ball 3 0. But there's a game within the game here because Steve Carse is a critical part of the Cleveland success or was during the regular season. First, as a reliever. I mean, he was just overpowering out of the bullpen as a setup man. I mean, the seventh and eighth innings belong to him, and then Jackson for the ninth. If you didn't beat him in the first six, you didn't beat him. But then they moved him into the rotation. They have a little shortage. They're not able to make the trade they wanted for an extra pitcher. But after three starts, he got hurt. And Carse was on the disabled list up until September the 21st with a strained tendon in, in his right forearm, which he hurt in his third and final start. So he came back for maybe the last 12 days of the regular season. And to have a fully healthy Steve Carse to be able to do what he did in the first half of the season out of that bullpen changes the look of this Cleveland ball club greatly. Yes. He was very important like you say earlier and it's probably unfortunate for him that he did start those games but they were like you said had some injuries and they decided to give him a start and he pitched well in the first start because we were here. Yeah. Doing the game but Is that, I think Seattle. Yeah but it's a problem when you're used to being a re middle reliever and then you start. I mean it changes your whole pattern and that sometimes gives you trouble. I want to tip my hat here a little bit to Mike Stanley John. He can hit. I mean he'll shoot one down the left field line. He'll shoot one the right field as he just did there. I mean he is swinging a bat very very well. He said five hits in this series five for seven in the two games last night only Stanley and Garcia Parra had any hits at all and Stanley had three including an RBI single to drive in Garcia Parra in one of those uh, at bats. Garcia Parra had the other two hits. Well, Stanley's got two more hits today, although Garcia Parra 0 for 3. And there's shooter Rod Beck, the longtime veteran closer of the San Francisco Giants. Last year had a great year with the Chicago Cubs. Now in the bullpen for the Red Sox as Husky goes down on strikes against Carse, who looked pretty nasty with that pitch. Well, let's take a look at this pitch. I mean, it looks like it might be a splitter, but it was a little hard for a splitter. Maybe just a sinker. So Muskie went down out of the strike zone. Carse is uh, pretty quick. I mean, he's often up there around 94, 95 miles an hour. But he's had a lot of arm trouble over the years. That sinker is in there for a strike. To 
Trot Nixon, who has doubled and scored the Red Sox only run, and who was lined out to first. Carse has been plagued with arm troubles over the years. Either a slider or a splitter. I don't know. One ball, one strike. You're right. He was with the Oakland A's for a while. They always thought he was going to be great. There's Richie Sexton taking over at first base for Jim Tomey. Yeah, Tomey's backup has 116 yeah. RBIs <laughs> this year. <laughs> pretty, pretty deep bench. A lot of movement on that sinker. But back in the 1984, Carse had arthroscopic surgery on his right elbow to repair cartilage damage but then missed all of the 1995 season after he underwent the so-called Tommy John ligament transplant surgery at the end of spring training of that year and then he spent much of the next year kind of rehabbing the elbow trying to build his strength back up and he had a couple of different stints of the disabled list this year with Cleveland John, I bet Tommy John's arm starts to hurt every time he hears that phrase, Tommy John surgery. Well, how about this guy's shoulder? Yeah. So about the only thing that hasn't happened to Brett Saberhagen in his career medically is that they haven't named a surgery for him. Well, that is the first walk allowed by a Cleveland pitcher today, as uh, Charles Nagy was never better. Seven innings, one run, five hits allowed by Nagy today. No walks. Two men on, one man out, and Damon Buford will come up. 11-1, Cleveland is leading. Last year, after they dispatched the Red Sox in the division series, and it was Cleveland and the Yankees in the league championship series, the Yankees disposed of the Rangers very quickly last year. And that's called strike. And that series, for a while, Looked like it might go against the Yankees. They were down two games to one. And you mentioned earlier in our telecast today, Joe, about Tomey's near home run, a near three run homer against El Duque in game four. There's a hanging breaking ball, but Buford pops it into shallow left. Justice. That's out number two, the runners hold. Stanley at second, Nixon at first. Two down and Offerman coming up. And I've often wondered. What if Tommy's three run home had not been knocked down by the wind? Suddenly it's three nothing in that first. That whole game might have been much different because El Duque ended up pitching a great game. Seven shutout innings. But what if? Yeah, no, I agree with you because they had the Yankees on the ropes. They just couldn't apply the knockout blow. But it, uh, Tommy thought he had hit a home run. I thought he had hit a home run, but the wind just knocked it down. Offerman, a fly ball to center. Lofton is waiting for it. Offerman two for four. Two men left for Boston. Manny Ramirez. And we'll pick up that series Atlanta Houston tomorrow. Four Eastern from the Astrodome here. Cleveland has things well in hand. An 11 to 1 lead over Boston in the last of the eighth inning. And uh, again, the Aflac. I know, John. I know who it is. Trivia question. Before Pedro Martinez won a game last year, who was the last Red Sox pitcher to win a postseason game? You know, I thought about the spaceman, but then I said no. He, he was he was earlier. Bruce Hurst. Well, that was easy. <laughs> easy. <laughs> Bruce Hurst was easy. I mean, everybody knew that. <laughs> oh, it's obvious. Okay. <laughs> Who else would it have been? It's the first trivia question I think I've ever had correct yeah. on this show. I I, uh, I have a feeling it was rigged. <laughs> <laughs> Rod Beck. This was the Affleck trivia question scandal. One day they'll make a movie out of it. 2-0 oh the count to Manny Ramirez facing Rod Beck. Shooter. He used to call him. He was with the Giants. And a new shortstop has also come in for the Red Sox. Lou Merloni replacing Nomar Garcia Parra. Loss of power and a loss of syllables. <laughs> Two and one the count to Ramirez. He's 0 for 3 with a walk. And that uh, split finger pitch for Beck pulled foul. Right back. Doesn't throw as hard as he used to. But I've heard him described, Joe, in fact, by Brian Sabian, the general manager of the San Francisco Giants, as being a warrior. He's got that warrior mentality. He's a competitor. And he finds a way to do it, as he did with the Cubs last year. By the end of last year, he had nothing left and still got the save in that 
great playoff game between the Cubs and Giants at Wrigley Field. Well, John, I agree with him because what happens is a lot of times when a pitcher realizes he has nothing, you know, you can tell that he knows that on the mound. Rod Beck will go out there with nothing and he still looks at you like you can't hit me. And I think that helps him to get through a lot of the times when he is struggling. But he used to have a great fastball, slider, and a splitter. He had all those things, plus he had good control. High fastball is lofted foul down the right field line. Trot Nixon comes over, but it is in amongst the spectators out of play. Two balls, two strikes. Ramirez will be followed by Sexton, and then Harold Baines due up third in the inning. Cleveland ahead 11 to 1, despite having only eight hits. There's Sexton. And there's Baines in the hole. Two and two. Rod Beck had 51 saves for the Cubs last year. And that is a changeup too high. Three and two the count. Beck this year started off very slowly. And it was evident things were not right with him. And then he ended up shutting it down and had some elbow surgery. He, just, he, he described it this way. It was his 500 appearance <laughs> uh, cleanup for the elbow. I guess he had some chips in there, a bone spur, some sort of thing. And he's pulled foul down the left field line. But he came back with the Cubs, and of course the Cubs had completely fallen apart. And he began building his strength back up, working in middle relief. He became a mop-up man for the Cubs. But then the Red Sox, in need of uh, some experience, at the end of the bullpen, picked him up, hoping that it might work out and it did he did a great job for them and three big saves late in the season and he strikes out Ramirez it's the third time Ramirez has struck out in this game Jacobs field in Cleveland a, uh, a beautiful ballpark but a nightmare for the Red Sox today and whenever the Goodyear blimp is hovering above a game with its camera focused on an event you know you're going to get a unique view Overhead today, the Goodyear blimp, Spirit of Akron, based in Suffield, Ohio, very near Akron, which is the world headquarters for the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Richie Sexton, a fastball off the outside, one ball and no strikes. Rod Beck was traded to the Red Sox, arrived at Fenway Park during the game. You know, as the game was starting, he was coming through the Ted Williams Tunnel from Logan Airport. Got into the dugout in uniform about the third or fourth inning and met his manager in the dugout. They sent him out to the bullpen. They never told him to do what. <laughs> and then he got up before the ninth inning, and, and that's when he discovered they wanted him to be the closer that day. <laughs> <laughs> a job he had not done since, I don't know, April? Six, and it's a high drive deep to center, but playable for Buford. And he makes the catch. That's out number two. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority. The commissioner of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts or descriptions of this game, such as they are, may not be disseminated without express written consent. So now they brought back in for the ninth inning to get the save. I mean, right. tight, tight ball game. On the mound, that's when he met the catcher for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name, is, my name is Jason Veritek. I'm your catcher. <laughs> What do you want to throw here? Yeah. What do you have? What do you have? So they discussed <laughs> that for the very first time. And then Beck ended up getting the save against Kansas City. And the last guy that he got out was Jeremy G Giambi, right? The younger brother yeah. of Oakland's Jason. Jason Giambi. And after the game, they said to Beck, gee, you've never been in this league before and all that. And he said, well, with Giambi, I just pitched him the same way I always pitched him in spring training when we used to play Oakland. <laughs> and they said, well, wait a minute. That was... That's Jason Giambi. This is his younger brother, Jeremy. He says, oh. <laughs> well, I pitch him the same way I pitch his older brother. <laughs> <laughs> right back. Whoever they are, he knows how to get him out in a tight ball game. Here's Harold Baines. One ball and two strikes. Pedro Martinez injured last night, but there is his brother, Ramon Martinez, his older brother. And he will be pitching in the game that the Red Sox hope will begin a miraculous turnaround in this series. So Baines is gone. Rod Beck has a three out, three down inning. Three outs to go for the Red Sox. It's 11 to one.
The Cleveland Indians looking awfully good. About to go up two games to none in this best of five series over the Red Sox. Highlights of this one and everything else that's going on in baseball and the world of sports coming up on SportsCenter. Bob Lee and Larry Beal right after the ball game will update you on everything. The post-game highlights and interviews with Mark Schwartz right here with Jacobs Field. Plus a preview of game three between Houston and Atlanta tomorrow afternoon from the Astrodome. Stay tuned. Sports Center comes up next. Here's Mike Jackson. The Cleveland closer getting some work in. He had 39 saves during the year. John Ballantin takes ball one. Also changes on the infield for Cleveland and behind the plate. Jackson's numbers. That pitch counts. Ballantin would ask for timeout. It was not granted by Larry Young. There's the new catcher, Anar Diaz, and the new second baseman, Enrique Wilson. The Alomars are out of the game. Ballantin with a fly ball along the left field line into the corner. David Justice. And in fair ground, he's got it. Let's go to our spotlight reporter, Rick Sutcliffe. John, I kind of think lost in the 11 runs by the Cleveland Indians tonight has been the performance of Charles Nagy. He's done exactly what he needed to do. He threw strikes all day long. That defense is going to love that. Look at him on the outer half of the plate right here. He can go soft and expand the zone. He throws the fastball for a strike when he has to. But he works quick, and as Joe knows better than anybody, the defense loves to play behind him. He didn't walk anybody today, and it just seemed like the Cleveland Indians hit all day, and the Boston Red Sox had to play defense. Yeah, no. Your, your assessment, Joe? Yeah, we talked earlier about he had good sink, had a good sinker, he had a splitter, and a, most of all, he threw strikes. Veritek is gone. As the ball caught by Enrique Wilson. Two men gone. We're in the ninth inning. Coming up later tonight, the Yankees and the Texas Rangers on Fox at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Then tomorrow on ESPN at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. The Braves and Astros. Big game. Glavin and Hampton at the Astrodome. That series tied at a game apiece. Then the Diamondbacks and Mets tomorrow night on NBC from Shea Stadium. Also tied at a game apiece. And the big crowd on its feet. And almost everybody's still here at Jacobs Field. Despite this game having, for all intents and purposes, being over since the fourth inning, they're all still here. This is part of the fun, I guess, for the Cleveland fan. They don't want just the win and to enjoy Cleveland beating up on somebody. They want to be here for everything that happens right to the very end, that final big cheer at the end. And when they leave the ballpark at long last after a win, moments later, you'll hear them out on the streets in traffic beeping their horns like it's New Year's Eve. Lou Maloney pops it up. Enrique Wilson and the Indians are officially ahead. Two games to none in this division series. But I think the Indians are serving notice that they are going to be very difficult to eliminate this year. The bats are jumping. Tomorrow, Dave Berber, I mean, he gets their next start. Nagy pitched well today. Last yesterday, Bartolo Colon pitched well. This is a true team. I, I mean, offense and defense, and I think someone's going to have a problem eliminating them. 11 to 1 the final. Nagy the winner. Saberhagen the loser. Baines a three run homer. Tommy a grand slam. It was uh, quite uh, an impressive victory for Mike Hargrove's Indians. Now they'll try and wrap it up on Saturday at Fenway Park against Ramon Martinez and the Red Sox. Joe will be with you tomorrow night from New York with Bob Costas and NBC. I'll visit with you tomorrow afternoon from the Astrodome with Rick Sutcliffe. We hope you'll join us at 4 Eastern, 3 Central, 1 Pacific, the Braves and Astros. Sports Center coming up next. Stay tuned for that. John Miller for Joe Morgan and Rick Sutcliffe from Cleveland. Thanks for tuning in. Cleveland Indians up two games to none.